I want to thank everybody that is joining us live here. We are having another conference call. Um, it's been a long time since we've had one. We have Sophia here, we have Catherine here, and we have a new person to join us tonight, Stephen Sanziri. Hope everybody well, is doing good. It, well, well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Uh, so, so far it's, it's just us, but if anybody else um, who has the call-in information wants to come on, I will make sure to uh, pop them in as well. I'm going to give a little visual over here, maybe play something or just kind of have something going on in the background. Uh, but uh, I believe and I'm going to pull up the, the chat. I hope everybody in the chat is doing good. Hope you all can hear us. Thank you all for uh, hanging in there while we are or were a few minutes late. Uh, Catherine, can you hear me OK on your side? Am I speaking at a normal level yes human being. yes it sounds really good i i do not have my ear pressed up against my screen good. i'm glad <laughs> well we got Yay. about we got about uh uh six or seven people in the um chat even though i look on live chat and it says that we have one so we'll <laughs> I'll go with that no problem that's how youtube works so we're not going to worry about any of that oh and all of a sudden it switched to eight excellent so welcome ev everybody uh, I'll try to keep the chat open uh, so I can follow along. Let us know if you have, if you hear any I issues, any audio issues. We are going to start with uh, my new friend, and I feel like talking to Stephen Sanziri. It feels like when we just started chatting, it's just like we had always been been friends, and that's that's really cool that 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 happens. It, that doesn't always happen here, um, but what I got for you, Stephen, I got a list of questions here just some uh just some questions that i would like to uh, cover but i think what a lot of people would probably want to know from you is who are you um can you kind of give us a little uh information about your background what you've done in the in the past and then we're, we're going to jump into your views on this case well no that'd be great thank you um briefly um <laughs> born and raised in san francisco and down the peninsula um, called San Mateo, San Jose State. I became a police officer in 1982 for Burlingame, um, and that's in California. And then um, I opened those, also opened the Gold's Gym at that time, so I kind of left police work after a few years. Um, and I went, uh, got back in as a reserve per diem, and I started working bigger cases with uh, the police department in Foster City. And I left there and moved up to the mountains and um, became a bail agent and a PI and bounty hunter, and I ended up getting involved in the um, Yosemite Sites Your Murder Case, which I wrote a book about called Ultimate Prey. And so that's pretty much where I'm here. And, um, I'm 61 years old now, but still have a lot of uh, investigation in me, and I've, I've seen a lot of cases from the Yosemite case to Shonda Levy. Scott Peterson case, I had a little bit of uh, that with some evidence that I found. So that's kind of my background, guys. So any questions uh, regarding this case? That's great. Um, you have uh looked at some of the documents have you been able to go through uh, the crime scene photos the doc i know there's a ton of stuff there uh but how much mm -hmm. of the stuff ha in the in the few days that i sent it over to you how much have you been able to actually get through well the, the last um document you sent me was basically all the uh, forensic evidence and where it was going and how it was uh, diagnose the DNA off the blood, you know, matching up to the crime scene. So I, I really took a look at that with all the photographs, and there's a lot of, a lot of loose ends I, I, I see um, from casing counts to um, trajectory of a bullet in the ceiling, um, and two bullets uh, to the head and one behind the daughter's uh, ear. Um, there was more more rounds shot. Um, the crime scene was messy. I, I you know, what, what um, David was doing with uh, Gray State. Um, and you know he, you know I, I went through his Facebook uh, earlier tonight, and I could see, I mean this guy, there was stress in him and such, but with what he had going on, this this didn't happen. And, and one of the biggest thing is uh, when he was when he was murdered, um, the condition of his uh, face and skull and uh, his arms being stretched out like a crucifix. And uh, what was? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that, you know, that's exactly one of the first things that struck me as well. And I had shown that photo to um, a retired police officer that I knew. 
um, here in the U.S. and then also to a police department in another country. And the very first thing all of these officers said, without exception, is uh, this this isn't right. No, no, it isn't. And um, I looked up some um, very gross text, gr gross um, and sad pictures of people that have gotten shot in the head with a 40 caliber. And when I looked at these photos, the first thing I thought was this was a, this was a shotgun. You know, there's, uh, David and uh, Kamel, their faces were totally gone. Um, and, you know, I see shots from these 40 caliber, uh, you know, on, online, and I don't see them being that bad. You know, and, uh, you know, and there's, there's some things I'll get in with the dogs and I've researched and such. But, um, and that's why I make, there's two shots in maybe each of them. But David would, fall, would have fell, fell forward, and the shot came from the back of his head to blow his face out. Didn't come under his chin. Didn't have it, had an exit through his face through the front. And if it does that, um, he's shot from behind the head. And usually, you don't put a pistol behind your head to commit suicide. And then right. he would have fell. He would have fell forward. So there you go. Right. And and the thing, the the reason why I'm not sure if that is right or not, and I I don't know if you've actually read the autopsy reports, is because the autopsy, which I don't really put a lot of um, faith in either. So if you have a whole different view on this, I'm all ears. <laughs> but the autopsy reports state that there's um, exterior beveling to the wound that's behind the ears on the victims. So I'm like, okay, which means that it would have had to, plus they don't, they say they don't know the entrance, they only know the exit, blah, blah, blah. But even with all of that being said, if there's a shot from the side of the head and um, with there's just, it does not make sense to me that the amount of damage done to that face would have occurred, and I mm -hmm. do not believe a dog would have done it. Correct. Okay, um, since we're on that, Catherine, for a second here, I researched um, uh, dogs and pet owners when a pet owner dies in the house and the dog's locked up, and what kind of wounds are there po post-mortem, and it was very interesting, and this is, we you know, we have... David's right hand missing um, the daughter's right arm and both hands of um, Kamel. Okay, here's what it says. These are statistics. From, I pulled the statistics up from 2014-15. Okay, when a dog eats an owner, former owner, 73% of the time they will go for the face. Okay, 15% of the time they will go to the abdomen, chest for the nutrients. This is an indoor dog that's trapped. Okay, now there's a difference between indoor and outdoor. The outdoor dogs most of the time will go for uh, the entrails, the, the inside where the nutrients are because they're outdoor, okay? Followed by the face, and last is, is the limbs. Limbs are the lowest on both categories. Less than, less than, less than 15% are limbs. So the dog didn't chew, chew on the, the, the limbs and, and take them off. Those, those, those were severed. Uh, and you know what? And I I agree. And I think I've read that that statistics that you're those statistics that you're talking about. And here's another interesting thing that I think well something I will think you will find interesting. When I spoke with the coroner, the med I'm sorry, the medical examiner here where I live, and he was trying to convince me that this dog did all this damage to the bodies. And I'm like, uh uh uh, no no, no I've seen some too. And so he brings out a photo of of an older person, now mind you, older people have softer bones and stuff like that, but an older person who supposedly was devoured by their dog in just 16 hours. But my comment to him was the first thing I noticed is as I told him, I said, but her head is still intact. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to tell me that this little dog ate two heads and left a smaller head that's more pliable alone, and but yet ate that arm. I said, what you're trying to tell me doesn't add up to what I see in the scene. And he just got really upset because I'm like, but her head is still there. I mean, yes, the flesh was missing from the head. And I, I, and it's, I don't know if he was trying to shock me with the photo, but I've seen dead bodies and decomp and watched autopsies, so it's like, okay, sorry, dude. You, you can't shock me, but um, he never did respond to that. So, um, it, have you ever seen? It, it, have you seen a dog that is actually um, consumed? I have. That's one thing I have to say 
personally, I have not seen in person was um, uh, scavenging by an animal. Have you seen anything like that? No, not with a dog. I've, I've seen it with uh, maggots in a bathtub of a guy who just couldn't get out and was actually being eaten alive. Um, but it was also interesting because the maggots went for the face and for the entrails. But um, on, on if the, I, I believe there's a good chance the dog ate, ate, the, ate the face and, and the parts there. And the reason is, is that in the statistics, it's, it's, it's very high on an indoor dog, okay? 73% of indoor owner's bites and, or post-mortem uh, uh, cannibalism or whatever for, for, for meals for a dog is 73% indoor will go for the face first. So if that was opened up by a bullet wound, the dog would then make it bigger, wider, you know what I'm saying, it would clean it out. And then what would happen is it goes for the entrails. Um, with his daughter's stomach, I looked at it, and it looks like the dog might have started there. Um, and I'm not, because, but there's some looks like almost some like knife wounds almost there, you know. Um, so I, I can't quite make that out. Yeah, know? what you're seeing. Um, I'm sorry. I don't want to presume. Presume. I'm sorry. And please feel free to put me in my place and tell me to be quiet. Oh, no, I'm fine. Oh, go ahead. Um, but what is uh, what you see on on Rania's abdomen is the marbling and some of the skin coming away in the slippage. But y oh. you are correct. Her her abdomen was fully exposed, and yet right. that puppy or that dog, that little dog, wasn't a puppy. But the dog never touched her abdomen, and yet did she was also shot in the head. But her her face was not eaten. And yet, somehow, Kamel, who was face down on the ground, had her entire face and larynx mm -hmm. missing. So how did that happen? And this is what oh, I well, tried to put right. forth. I mean, where her okay. head was positioned fairly close right. to the couch, well, A, you can't because the head doesn't move. I mean, something had to have been missing to have her place as close as she was anyway. But what do you have to say about that? Oh, well, I, I, it's, it's a 50-50 answer, but she was shot behind the ear, so that would take the trajectory out of the skull to the opposite side. If she was laying on that side, it wouldn't, you wouldn't see her face blown off. You'd see her side of her face. She was, shot, she was shot behind the ear. Kamel and David were shot in the back of the head. Okay? And if you, if you look at bullet 57 that went into the attic through the ceiling, if you look at that trajectory in an automatic, semi-automatic weapon where it discharges the spent cartridge to the right and how far it goes, and I'm seeing it in a crime scene, and I know that's not accurate by, you know, it's probably by feet, really, but, you know, still the trajectory is the same. Uh, bullet 57 may have been a warning shot over his daughter holding her hostage when maybe then David came in or something like that, and David didn't believe it and then shot the daughter and maybe shot, you know what I'm saying, because that trajectory is even off. But she did. She was shot in the back, yeah. right behind the ear, right behind the ear. Sad to say, so it would be a different ex exit wound than, than the front. But the, you know. Okay. So I mean, this is this this is good because according, um, and and I'm going to trust you seriously right now over anything I read in these reports, including the autopsy reports, because the autopsy reports are saying that the exit wounds for both David and Kamel are in the left parietal section of the head and they call them exit wounds. And um, because they're saying it's ex ex external beveling, which means that the damage, the, the traject, the bullet or the, yes, the projectile is then coming through the inside of the, the skull to the outside, which would cause the beveling on the out exterior of the, of the skull. But you are saying from what you are seeing and what you have read that you believe that they were shot in the back of the head. Is that what you understand, at least so far, which could change? The, until, in, until I saw this stat with the indoor dog, 73% for the face or skull when it's opened up, I've I've thought like I said the first thing I thought was a shotgun. I couldn't believe a 40 caliber, and I you know I took like I pulled the pictures up and I've seen in the old days a couple headshots. They are not they don't they don't blow the whole face out. They not really don't. They'll, they'll deform and everything else. But um, I, I kind of question that just from what I could see how much was opened up. I mean all it was all all it was attached was the back of his skull to the spine. The whole head was gone literally. So it tells right. me that after so after I was reading. The, th the stats on canines, I believe the canine, 73%, could have went in there and really did a number and cleaned it out. Yes. I okay, think but... Yeah, that's what I think. 
I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I have a bad habit of, of interrupting. I'm sorry. Oh, it's, no, it's okay. No, no, you're fine. No, because here's um, the narrative goes, though, is that the faces were not blown out by the bullet per se. Um, they're trying to say, of course, that they were shot with the 40 cal, um, but that the dog ate the faces and the skull, and that the damage seen was done by the dog and not the bullets. Well, there's the other thing is I, I think Camille had two bullets went through her, I think. And, you know, the, the, I, I, count, I count seven casings, seven bullets, basically, because they're counting one casing unidentifiable, which means it was maybe it was another around from different manufacturer. But cops know around this, so I'm calling seven shots, okay? I'm calling two to Camille, two to David, and then one, one to the daughter. That's five shots. One went up into the ceiling up there, and the other one was lost also. There was two, basically, that were lost. So he was shot in the. I think he was shot twice to give it that effect to the front of the face. That I think that's also a good theory on this. There was one that was shot in into the base into the living room floor that was lodged in the in the basement too. Uh, that was item forty five. And there was no no blood and yeah. no DNA found on 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 that on one. that bullet. Does does that, that one show? That, oh yeah, they, they got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, that's that's. I'm sorry. That's yeah. See, those are two bullets that didn't hit targets. And that that adds up really to seven bullets. And then there's so one. So five and five and. Yeah, and there's there's one unspent round that was found in the living room floor. Mm -hmm. What what do you right. think about that? About that mm -hmm. one? That one wasn't tested either. Unspent round. Um, like I said, I think this is this is, this is I don't, I'm not calling this necessarily a, a, a pro pro hit on a pro hit on this thing. There's more than one person involved. I think it's a very sloppy crime scene. The cover-up's poor. He didn't walk around the whole house bloody and do all this kind of stuff. They had gloves on, and they, they were looking for, you know, for some stuff. You ask why the dra drapes were open, the, and, you know, and um, nobody took his computer or anything like that. You know what? Um, they were going to get to it anyway. You know, these guys were, were sloppy hit, and that's why you got why, – why is that – what's with the mist up in the ceiling, yeah. Greg, you know? Yeah. If you're that close, you usually get something, and I think it was a warning shot. I think they were going to be – it was going to be a – hostage suffering thing and then they you know and then they they you know, mutilated them too you know i mean this isn't this isn't one guy and, and it's it's not it's not it was a black ops it would be just like phil marshall yeah it would be and clean out, it'd be right? clean yeah clean really clean yeah. so well, this is this is this is that's what i think and and since you're a former officer, can I would really like to get this kind of cleared up because this item 57 has been a huge bone of contention, because um, we well especially Greg I don't want to say me Greg has been trying desperately to get <laughs> the actual photograph of that bullet hole in the ceiling from the day of the crime and they do not and will not give him a copy of that photograph yet they give us the copy and they first noticed it and they state in their reports that they noticed it and were informed of that bullet hole in the ce ceiling a month later there's no mention in any reports prior how often does that occur where, th where a police officer would walk into a scene like that and not even bother to look up when they're even moving a Christmas tree out of the way which is where the bullet hole would have been Oh, absolutely! No, absolutely, absolutely. And it's it's not a large house. It has eight foot ceilings. You get the right. It's right in front of you. So, do you think that you could? Is it easy to miss, or should they have seen it? Oh no, they should have seen it. No, it's very easy. It's, like I said, eight foot ceilings. It's right. You know, you you wouldn't miss that. Well, yeah, because that's kind of what I, I questioned one of the officers about. I sent him an email and I said, you know, I'm reading the report, and you know it. It states that you put on the, a month later an obvious defect in the ceiling. So was that missed on, or was it, am I missing it in the report, or was it missed by you guys on the date that you guys arrived at the crime scene? And no they response. Should caught, they, they, they should have caught it when they were at the crime scene the first first minute. You know. Yeah. You know, you know, holes in ceilings aren't, aren't normal if you really look up. There's really not a whole lot of holes in anybody's ceiling. You know, and the hole's not going to be super big or anything, but you'd notice it. Um, and, you know, my question, Catherine, is, you know, I looked at the uh, trajectory of 
57 the bullet up into the attic through the um, ceiling and I look where it would have been shot from with a discharge with um, out of the breach of the 40 caliber where did that casing go how far I line it up with with uh, casing number seven and that puts casing number seven that puts the gun behind um, the daughter's head even right then and that's why I think in the, so 57 he shot maybe shot in the air said I'm serious no 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 he shoots the daughter because um, that, that's the really makes parents will suffer forever just on that and it takes care of um, Karen or um, Kamel, but you know I still believe they were shot behind the head. So I think that you know there was somebody holding a gun to the daughter's head, and the other guys were behind them. You know it made, the guy didn't shoot her and run over because David, it would have something would have happened. To, so there was other people involved. That's how I believe it. That's because of the trajectory on number 57. You're right. You know that makes a lot of sense, and I think uh, um, a lot of people would agree with that. However, again, and I'm. I'm <sighs> Okay, please understand I'm not being argumentative. I'm trying to get this understanding in my head. So then how, so in, then other words that 57, that the, the defect in the ceiling actually was there then on that date and yet somehow it wasn't noticed until a month later because this, this is kind of where, you know, my, my theory or my thought process on this is is um, it wasn't there. 57 wasn't put into that ceiling until later on, maybe even the day that it was called in and when the police officer showed up again a second or third time and said, oh, yeah, there's an obvious defect in the ceiling. And I'm like, well, if it was there that first time, with the amount of people in and out between BCA, crime scene tax, the police officers, and even the sheriff's department, someone would have seen that defect in the ceiling. And they would have had to, at that point, put a little marker on it, at least tagged it and, and marked it. But it was not done by anybody. And I'm trying to, to formulate how that could have happened. Well, here's the thing, is that there's seven casings count on the floor, there's seven casings. Like I said, I, I, I tie a number seven casing from the angle and where the shooter was at to the bullet number 57. Um, maybe they didn't want to put that down. Uh, I don't know. It, it, you know, it, it, when you have a shot that's missed or there's something something that didn't go right, you know, and you, know, and you don't want to shoot that many shots, those, those houses aren't that far away. You start shooting, shooting it up in there. People can notice sooner or later. So, that that was a mistake, and that that mistake may have changed the mo into something else. You know, um, it makes them sloppier. If they, you know, now they're really sloppy. They got you know blood everywhere and all this and that, um, and, and prints um, that they haven't matched up because they know they got prints. Okay, um, I think it. I think it finally jived with what you just said. So some uh, things. That's, that's what I think. Yeah. Yes, so there were seven casings on that day, but only six fragments that were found, and that Fine. seventh fragment was then found a month later. Right. And gotcha. you to, like, like, like Greg said, you have two misses. You have one in the floor and one up there. I mean, that, you, you want to make the least amount. I'm, you know, if these guys were pros, they would have been silencers for sure. Um, maybe, maybe they were, but still, they're, they're missing. I mean, these guys don't miss. I, so they could have been warning shots, you know, you know get, the, get the people frantic. Um, if it's some people that Greg and I talked about, you know, they know where everything's at. I don't know if what was taken as far as any kind of, you know, like you'd call it robbery. It's not that. Um, and um, the, the blood, the blood, all of the all of writing, uh, jihad writing on the wall. Greg said they misspelled that. Yeah, they had. Yeah, well, um, the one thing that you know I did find interesting, and it was Sophia who actually pointed it out to me. So I went back and I looked through the photos. Um, was that you know we know David was a filmmaker, um, and he uh, she pointed out to me, um, although she states that she wasn't the first person who saw it, but she was the one who told who showed it to me, was that there was a camera, a security camera in the garage, just one, and yet there were people for some reason looking up in the attic. Um, now, in your experience, how often does someone who has security cameras only have one and have it in the garage? Um, well, somebody who's really poor, not to be facetious, but other than that, you know, the garage, you'd probably, you know, one inside in the living room and one outside in the front yard or something. Um, I mean, at least three of them or something like that, not just one. Most people don't just put one up. Yeah, and because uh, that's what I was kind of curious about, too, because I'm like, well, 
you know, again, this is theory and speculation and absolutely zero proof any of it even existed, but I'm like going, okay, if there was one, there had to have been more, and where were they and who took them? Well, um, here's, here's, I'm, like, I'm trying to say, you know, first it looks like, you know, right off the face of it, it's a deep state, Illuminati, you know, the whole thing. Um, a Philip Marshall type hit, you had too much information, whistleblower kind of stuff. Well, if there was that, if that's if they if they get caught, um, but it has to be something that looks, you know, it makes you know. There's no way this this man was that crazy. The PTSD, whatever the stuff that was that happened, it, the, the, the position he was laid out in. The gun, I mean, this thing he didn't he didn't he didn't kill his wife and you know, murder his daughter and, and then shoot himself. That didn't happen. No, there's no way. Absolutely, I'm 100 percent sure of that. Yeah, and I agree with that too. And from um, the medical background, I I was an EMT for um, over ten years, first responder, I should say, ENT, IV certified EMT. Plus, I um, used to hang with a, a deputy coroner, and I used to, was able to go on um, ride-alongs with them. Plus, I knew a uh, sheriff's deputy, so. Um, I got to do ride-alongs with all of these people and see a lot of different stuff, plus the stuff I did. And with Ronya's third rib being fractured underneath close to where the armpit is, the, the lateral side, on her left-hand side, I will tell you that is not something a dog could do because it's a, like almost up underneath the armpit. There's no way that dog could have supposedly pulled her arm out of the socket and then fractured her rib. That was done by somebody else by a, a form of blunt force trauma, some type of pressure or something like that. So that to me, when I saw that and, and when I watched videos of David with his daughter, that man loved his daughter. He loved his wife and he loved his daughter. And not to say that men who love their family don't do horrible things, but this is not something that is consistent with who David was. And when I watched a, um, uh, an interview that um, Eric Sayward had done, he just happened to pop up at some park where David and Camille and Rania were. And then who, so there was this guy behind the camera asking David, hey, where's your daughter? Can we go talk to your daughter? Well, David then positions his body between this man and his family. And he's like, you know, they don't feel comfortable right now. They're really scared. Now, that is that is a man who's prote protecting his family, not someone who would then go and rip an arm out and fracture his daughter's rib. Or, or am I wrong? Do, does that happen? No, I don't think so. You know, they just, you know I even think maybe that uh, Kamel was posed, you know. I mean, it, when you fall... You know, she put this the way her legs were spread way open, way wide. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't stand like that. You're gonna fall to a point with her with in or out very you know, not too much var variables of where you were standing. You know exactly. what I'm saying? Hmm. And so as her legs were all spread, that was done when, and the baby was laid there like that. It's there's something with that. And that's what I'm, I was the first thing I thought, you know, this little this little girl. And then and that way the mother was posed. You don't, you don't, your legs don't spread. If you were shot in the back of the head, it's so immediate, you, you just drop. Your right. legs don't spread. The floor wasn't that, she didn't slip out that wide. She was in good shape, you know? Yeah, she, um, and she I, was on a, a rug. <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. Um, and also with the covering of the blanket, um, David's partially on his foot. Um, you know, maybe he had the blanket with him on his chest or something, and he, when he fell, it, you know, that's what happened. It would have went forward anyway. But I think it's that they're maybe thinking of covering something up. With, I don't know, you know, with the blanket under part of his leg. And well, he, the dog could have done that, you know. Well, well, here's the thing, though, is the blanket was under Kamel and over David. Her sweater yeah, was blood. also partially covering his leg. And so it's like, okay, it, it is so, it, to me, and again, I know I could be wrong, but the way I read this scene, it's like, it's so staged. And Kamel's left hand was under her body, and she's missing her left hand. Mm -hmm. And both so, hands. Yeah, right. Yes. Both yes. Hands. Well, yeah, the, the, right, the right hand was exposed, so they're trying to say the dog did that. But the left hand is absolutely underneath her body. So how could the dog eat a hand that is completely under her body? It had no, to have no, been removed. Yeah. No, absolutely. 
Um, the other thing is, is uh, I researched how long dogs will wait before they will, you know, eat their owner or have a meal. And um, depending on the dog's size, it's anywhere from five to eight days. That they, if they don't get fed, but it also depends on their size, weight, shape, their you know age, and water. Water is a big thing. They'll fin- they'll finish their water up before they do that a lot of times. But it's 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 five to eight days they they will do that, start that. That is good to know. That is good to know. Yeah. And you can go ahead. Um, there was two points I wanted to make uh, in regards to Camel. The three spent bullets uh, that were found on the carpet that day all had her DNA. Her blood. Three hollow points. So it was three. That, yeah, she got shot three times. Okay, there's the yeah, others. A lot of a lot of bullets. Yeah. And then. Would a dog do that much scavenging if there is bags of food on the floor in the kitchen for him? No, I don't think so. Um, I've never seen a scene like that, but um, no. And there was there was a plenty of dog food, you're saying? Yes, there was a one large bag and then half of a large bag, and neither oh. of them had been scratched up, chewed up, mm-hmm. or anything like that. Okay, and that... And so, that 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 that's that's good. You told us about the three bullets because I was guessing too that and, and to Camille. Now, when you, if there's three, that'll explain why the front of the face was out. And that dog would, if he had food, no, the dog wouldn't have uh, then um, feasted on any kind of thing from the face or what have you. Um, and then that makes sense with the three bullets because it would do that kind of damage. Right. Uh, remind everybody yeah. of that, only because, um, well, I couldn't say it earlier, you guys are having such a great discussion, but also Derek in the, the chat had brought that up, too. And, uh, yeah. Sorry, can you say that again? Derek in the chat, uh, the live chat that's going on on YouTube, had brought it up also. Oh, okay. Uh, about okay. the three bullets. Sure, yeah. I just I just saw too much damage um, to the face. Like I said, the first thing I was it, thinking it had to be a shotgun. I've seen those. I've never it, seen a 40. Uh, the skull bones scattered throughout the scene and jaw bones and stuff like that. It's just, right. it, it's almost as if somebody took something to their faces. You know what? You, you might be correct on that because on both of them, they said it was just the back of the skull attached to the spine. So you're looking probably three quarters or more of, of the head gone. So that's why David had have had at least two. Because see, I, I looked at the photographs and it's pretty, it's pretty bad. So that's it a is. good point. Yeah, that's now, a good point. Well, that's why, it, you know. Go ahead, finish your thought. Thank you. Oh no, go ahead, Greg. I was gonna say, isn't it um, strange then that there that uh, with all of these bullets, none of David's blood is found on any of these bullets? How's that possible? Because DNA, and that was it. On what? Just the on DNA on what? item 57, the yeah. attic. They, they, have hair, they have hair. It. Yeah, they have hair and other things on those bullets. You know. Yeah, but there's but none of it belonged to David. It all belonged to Kamel or Rania. Not one of Correct. those fragments had David's hair, tissue, blood, or scalp. Nothing. That's so weird. That's well, then, well, then when, where did those bullets go that killed David? Yeah. <laughs> we That's we what don't we, even know if he was killed yeah. there. That's what we keep asking, and they won't answer us. If let's say they lined them up and used just three bullets through both of them, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't see the damage on Camille. You know, the bullet the bullet would have to go through two skulls. So I was, you know, if you think it that way, but otherwise, where's the where's the bullets for David? I mean, you know, and I'm, that's why I was looking. I could see da- I could see David's face, but not Camille's. That's why I'm, I think it, it's, they're not mentioning it, but there was a shotgun used. You know, one shot, you just pick up the, pick up the shotgun, you know, and it's possible, well, I don't know. You know, and, and you could very well be right. And um, the thing, too, is that I had um, my deputy corner friend look at um, a piece of skull that's in one of the photos. Um, and because I'm like, hey, look at this and tell me what I am seeing because I had a feeling what I was seeing but I didn't know for sure and I said okay tell me what tell me what I'm seeing here and they looked at it and they go oh this person I mean they're just looking at the skull and the first words out of their mouth was 
oh, this person was killed. This is multiple blunt force trauma. And I mean, my, I went cold. My literally, went, my blood went cold, and I said, "Excuse me." And um, they said, "Oh yeah." And now this is a deputy coroner that had over three thousand cases, so they know their stuff. They, they they deal with this obviously a lot. And um, they said, "Yeah." And they started pointing things out. They go, then they started counting. They stopped counting at ten, and they said there are at least ten, if ten or possibly more blows to the skull in this person and they said some of these are severe enough that they one of these blows could have killed them so they said the person which we then through reading the reports and putting together autopsy reports and, and you look at where things were found this piece of skull bone belonged to David and so he was actually beat his head you know he, had, he suffered multiple blunt force trauma as well as the gunshot wounds to the head. This man was brutalized. The whole family was brutalized. But um, so yeah, this, was, this wasn't. Yeah, this was. They didn't go in there quickly. But he, I was going to say something about some blood around Dave. But go ahead. Oh no no uh, no! Please please you go ahead. Oh, okay. So you know the head. The, like in, in the police academy, we were taught. You know, if you get in a fight, try to avoid the head. Like just a littlest thing with a baton. The guy looks like you shot him. It's terrible. Blood. They bleed from your face a lot. If you look at David's left sleeve, I mean, he's very blood-soaked, okay? Mm -hmm. If it was a situation when he was shot back in the head, uh, he wouldn't have his arm so soaked on the other side, on his left, because his hand's still in everything. Right side, yes. But his left side is very blood-soaked. If they beat him before they shot him, that he would, have, he would have blood all over him. And I think you're making a very good point. And I would look at the blood analysis. Uh, it's not splattered or anything like that, but it's so blood soaked on uh, his left hand that's uh, stretched out, his left arm, and holding soaked with blood. Um, and then you look at his wife and, from, you know, pants or whatever, and the little girl, but he's very blood, so blood soaked. And that probably came from uh, strikes to the head or in face. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and that's, <laughs> I mean, what I'm so glad you're here because things are just coming together in my brain now. I'll probably be up for the next two days taking notes. But um, because, yeah, looking at that photo, if you look at his shirt, it's almost a straight line down the center of his shirt, and it is only his left side that is soaked. Right. But yet, wait, where's his blood? They can't, they, they, do not find his blood or Rania's blood anywhere in that house, except for Rania's blood is on a, on a bullet fragment. That's it. Right. What you're saying is he possibly was just he was just beat, not shot. That's what you're thinking. We don't even know if he was in the house when this occurred. Oh, I believe he was. Because all the blood that was, well, when when they tested just. The 16 samples, was it 16 or 19? I think it was 19 samples. It was all Camels. Mm -hmm. Everything that came back, except for the blood that was on the knife and the cartridge that was, or the magazine that was in the, the gun. That was it. Correct. Everything else was Camels. The wall, the computer, the cell phone, the quote-unquote footprints there's, um, there's there's another DNA profile that's um, right the second DNA profile that yeah. we still don't know who that two to three belongs. unknown DNA profiles right so Greg what are you, are you thinking three people involved in this you know yeah <laughs> I We're have... answering for you now, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you turn it back on me? Um, yeah, definitely. I, I think multiple shooters from multiple uh, places, somebody standing by the front door, somebody else by the mm -hmm. back door, and um, somebody that knew this, this family, somebody that knew the house, and somebody that knew this dog. Mm-hmm. Was there any kind of a report on how come the neighbors didn't hear any gunshots or anything? They did hear something. We have two two neighbors. Um, uh, one neighbor mentions rapid fire rapid fire gunshots. He was asked to kind of narrow down the time and or the uh, date, and he came up he came up with um, he was able to narrow it down to December tenth. Now the problem with that is that um, all three people were still active and even uh, well at least david was seen after that 
date. Um, Kamel was still texting people. Um, so they were still activity. Right. So I don't know about that timeline. Then there was another neighbor who said that possibly he, he heard something that sounded like gunshots um, closer to Christmas, sometime between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. But that's it, you know, and there's a lot of neighbors in that area and they are they are close. Um, but I have to be honest, you know, I don't know if somebody was shot a couple doors down or even next next door. I don't know if I would recognize that as a gunshot either. You know, I think you'd have to really know. And it sounds like these these neighbors definitely um, that's why they weren't sure if it was a, a, a firecracker. And I know we've talked about this where. You know, if you listen to it, especially from a distance, uh, gunshots can sound like what we would think was a firecracker. So, uh, but the fact that we do have two neighbors that did say that they heard something is good. Um, the timing is not good because it doesn't really line up when what the police say, whereas they're pretty much saying that David committed these crimes um, on Christmas Eve, maybe even Christmas Day. Um, and so there's just there's not a whole lot to really back that up because of because of how many shots we're talking about. Kamel was shot twice, according to their theory. Um, the daughter was shot once, and David was shot once. That's not three rapid fire shots. Um, cool. That would account for three shots for shooting Kamel twice and shooting the daughter. But again, once you know, it sounds it sounds very plausible, but. When you start digging into it and digging digging deeper, it it just doesn't make sense. It it doesn't add up, and there's still missing shots that uh, nobody heard. Mm -hmm. Um, did you see David's left left hand? Have you seen that, Stephen? Oh, his left yeah, his left hand yeah. It's it looks it's just um, post mortem lividity and it... decom. Doesn't that look weird to you, the way that, that the thumb... I mean, have you ever seen anything or heard anything about that? The thumb, how it's pressed up against his other finger? To me, that was very odd. Why didn't the dog go after that? He goes after all of this other stuff. The, the dog eating... What the dog ate, to me, seems very selective. And there's no real rhyme or reason that I can come up with. Well, mm -hmm. if he's going to eat one of David's hands, why not eat both of them? If, he, if he's going to eat all of David's head, yeah. and there's a hand right there, the hand is pretty much like right there. Why not go after that? Anyways, any thoughts on well, that? Well, like I said, I got a, it's, it's an un, it was an unusual uh, query, but I looked up the percentages, and then 73% do the skull first. I mean, you know, it's, that's, and these, it's not like there's a bunch of these kind of cases, so you know, you'd be pretty solid with those figures, probably through SPCA or what have you. That this, right. you know, this is what's happened. Um, it, you know, it's happened for years, probably. So, you know, it's like I said, outside the, at the entrails and stomach, chest area, on the, for an outside dog, more for some reason. I those stats to go. So I go back, but like I said, the lowest uh, octane um, meal a dog would have would be the limbs. That's the lowest on both mm -hmm. categories. And, you know, I really have to say that what you're saying in the research um, is pretty close to what I saw that um, the medical examiner showed me because what was mostly missing were the, of course, all of the flesh, but were like the ribs. But again, this is an older person, um, very old. So ribs, um, arms and stuff, but the the skull bone, the vertebral column, all of that was still there, and even some of the ribs. But, um, yeah, the hands were gone, and so that was – it fits with, with what the statistics are, statistics are saying. Right. Well, if it, well, did that person die of a gunshot wound to the head? Did it open that cavity up up there? No. The difference too? Well, no. yeah, but see, the dog, the dog, won't, the dog won't do, do the brains um, – and such, unless it's, it's, there's an open wound or something started almost up there. That's kind of how this came around with the suicides into the head. Um, but the, as far as the limbs go, if they don't do that, they, they go to the entrails usually before the limbs. But they could do limbs, sure. And the older person's softer. You know, dogs know, know things like that, I'm sure. Yeah. You know? Um, and that, But it, it's a lower percentage of it, but it absolutely could happen, but it didn't happen in this case. Yeah. And um, there's something else, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to find my notes, but it is 
it is in here in in the report somewhere it is mentioned once in one place out of the however many pages we, we have right now to go through um, that and I believe and I could be wrong so okay I'm gonna leave the name out but one of the people it was either the officer or someone from BCA goes in and they're checking for rigor on the bodies now mind you they only check David and they still found some quote-unquote stiffness to David's arm but everything else was was had lost the rigor stage now and then they stated that they were then did and they write in their notes they did not check Kamel or Rania now that right there I'm like going why would you not if you're finding partial rigor in a in an arm in an extremity why would you not check the others for partial rigor well they would they, you can tell you, you can you can look I mean for one, it, it looks like the, the time of death's about the same time one and you just check one for rigor and there's obviously no heartbeat you know they, the other ones visu visually have rigor you know rigor rigor goes in in the first 18 to 24 hours you know, right. And it just de de decompose and de uh, 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 they de decompose at that time, but um, that's that's kind of how you know that, that I mean that's that, that that's how that works. I'm I'm just curious, you know, what else they covered up on it, you know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. And um, the one thing, and and I would like to get you know your input because so far everyone I've spoken to has agreed. And they didn't know they were agreeing because I asked them independently, but agreed with what the medical examiner here stated because I showed him the photo and I'm like, okay, how long, in your opinion, and I understand it's a photograph, just give me your best guesstimate, do you believe these bodies were laying there? And without pausing, he goes four to seven days, ten days at most, he goes, these, are, these bodies were not there that long. And I said, okay, so why... And why? What are you going on to do? I mean, I'm not questioning. He's a doctor, but I was just trying to get information. And he said, based on the marbling and the condition of the bodies, and he asked the temperature of the room and where were they located. And I told him that the house was set to was it 68 degrees, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Set to 68 degrees. The back door was just cracked. Now it was it was not open, but it was still cracked. And I asked him. I said, "It's in Minnesota. It's winter time. It's cracked, but the temperature is set to 68 degrees. The heater was on when they walked in. Would that have affected? Could the cold air? Would it have been enough cold air to stop or slow the decomp process? And he said, "No. He goes, no. But in his professional opinion, they were really only there." four to seven days, ten days at most, which really lines up with what we are also finding, and yet the narrative is that they were killed December 24th, but found January 17th. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the other thing is, if you look at David's left hand, which Greg um, just touched upon, you can see that the, the uh, deep, 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 I can't talk today. Uh, decomposition. The, um, it, it's decomposition, mummified. Decomposition, thank you. Blah, 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 yeah, decomposition. Yeah. It's mummified. Well, that means is that uh, he was hit in the head several times. He lost blood rapidly. Somehow he lost blood rapidly. And what happens in there's less blood in the body, even though um, Camille was shot in, in, in the head and a daughter was shot behind the ear, is that he will bleed, he bleed out slower, uh, let's say, than if you, know, you, you cut a, a main vein or a, cardi, a carotid um, a vein. So he was probably bleeding out. That's why I think this, the, the hand looks like mummified compared to anybody else, you know. Interesting. And I think that's from that that goes along with continuous bleeding, bleeding, bleeding out in a certain way. Thank you for explaining that. We have been trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he's mummified more than anybody. Yeah. He was not killed in that house. I swear it. Oh my goodness. Where is his DNA? Where is his blood? I gotta. Go. I'm gonna look back. You know, we're done tonight. I'm, I'm gonna look reach back. I might have missed something on that. You know, I, and I'm saying that we all assume that makes you know what I've me and you. But um, yeah, you, I'm, I'm gonna look back, and that's, that's interesting. He was so he was brought in there after the fact, or brought him brought him in there when they were holding him hostage, or something. You're saying possibly. 
I mean, it, it's my opinion only because his DNA is just not found in the things that they tested. Now, there are, I believe, either 22 or 23 tests or samples that were not tested. I thought they, I thought like some of the blood in the other rooms and such on notepads were his blood. Mm -mm. Okay, I'll double check that. Yeah, they were able well, to match his fingerprint to, um, uh, to the blood uh, that was found in, in the notepad. And his blood was actually mm -hmm. found on the magazine of the gun. Too, right. But I think that's, that's the only place where, which is also weird. How does, how does it get there? Was he wounded? And I think that's the biggest thing. It's like, well, item 57 also kind of, you know, item 57, the, the unspent bullet, uh, all of that just looks like somebody or multiple people came into this house, broke their way, maybe, I don't know about broke their way in, but they were able to get in and, um, just do a lot of, a lot of damage. Yeah, th that, that is the whole thing. If, if, if they weren't killed there, you know, obviously that, that goes off into a whole another issue. Okay, where were they, were they killed? Is, was this a hostage thing? So there's, I mean, it just leads into so many different, different questions um, that it's, 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 I don't know, it's really frustrating, but um, that's why it's good to have these type of talks. So, you know, it's good to bounce ideas off of people. And I, I always learn something from these conference calls, always. Um, she may have a point on him being possibly murdered before that because it, it, look, it definitely has um, a lot more rigor and everything else. Plus, it, the, the color of the skin is usually that, that's, that's what I'm looking at. It's very, very dark. Um, but if he was, let's say he was murdered three days before that or something, I'm sure somebody would know. His wife would, you know, would have called somebody. Um, was he murdered in the backyard and brought in? I don't know. Um, the good question is, did I find a DNA, DNA or any kind of blood on those bullets uh, of his? And I got to double check. I thought I, I thought we had a match on that, but I know Greg spoke about the notebook and stuff. I know they have a match, but you know, there's so many places in the house that have blood. Right. You know, all over the place. The dishwasher. Computer. Why on the computer all of a sudden? You know, um, were they trying to get they, a file from him? You know. I was gonna let you know that they took 47 samples, and I'm trying to find where we posted this because I I took all the. Um, there we go. Let me see her post. So she went ahead and. As soon as my phone decides to work, let's see. There was uh, 47 samples taken from the crime scene. 16 were tested, 21 were not tested. Now, there were some handwriting samples that were taken from the crime scene, so those were the ones that were not tested. I think there was like 10 samples taken. Mm -hmm. And so they were not the DNA tests. But uh, out of all uh, that were on that DNA lab results were 47. 16 DNA items were tested, 21 samples were not. And when I had a conversation with the BCA over a year ago, maybe a year and, and a half, they still had those samples. Mm -hmm. But I just well, found it odd that they would... Sure, go ahead. Oh, oh. I'm kinda, I'd, like to, I'd like to go back, just go around a little bit on your you guys' opinion as, you know, what you've seen or know, how you read about. Would you agree this was a sloppy uh, execution? Yes. Okay. There's two, there's three, oh, there's yeah, Kathleen. Thank you. There's three things there picked off his face, Facebook, and this tells me he knew that something, somebody was on him. And I know Facebook off of um, the uh, indentation on the impressions on um, what was typed or written. So these are from the indent impressions after you know you write a piece of paper behind it, and they forensic it. And these are what and it was. It was scrambled a little bit, but here's this is verbatim. Undercover, great, great danger. Undercover, great danger. 
So he, he he wrote this on a piece of paper, and they got the impression. Okay, so he knows something's going on. He's not saying undercover great danger like he's undercover. I'm going to great danger to myself. He knows something's going on. Number two, the other impression that was uh, picked up, it says going to full auto. So he's looking at defending himself for some reason. Not going, going to full auto and shoot my family tomorrow. Just going to full auto. And the third impression picked up, um, civil matters. That means he knew that civil matters. Like it'd be, it'd be, you know, talking CIA company, you know, deep state stuff. You know, civil matters. You know, it, well, he's not talking about a lawsuit or anything. So these three things caught my eye uh, earlier tonight. And so he knew he was in great danger. He wrote that down on a piece of paper to himself. So something was, some he knew something was. He had, he had eyes on him. Something was going to happen, and he knew it. Oh, that makes so much sense with um, the stuff that um, Sophie and I found when we were going through the phone records and the text messaging and comparing those with what some of the, the guys from the gray state and his supposed friends were saying. They were saying that they had contact and they sent these texts and they called and there is zero proof of any of that. There's no proof whatsoever that any of those calls took place and in fact um, text messages and phone calls coming into his phone were then routed through to a whole different number. Um, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of really wow. weird stuff. And, and, oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. My, and my it didn't, so, oh, can I add can real I, quick, I just wanted to say that it didn't appear that David was doing the routing of the phone calls. And that's oh, what correct. I'd like to ask your opinion on is what does that mean? Was somebody coding their phone? It's uh, it's wiretap. Sure, um, you're, you know, it's supposed to have a warrant for that. The wiretapping is told, totally illegal. You have to let somebody know, like when you make a phone call, it's being recorded. Um, but the wiretap itself, um, you know, what the, the dark state and, and FBI or anybody could, could do, go ahead and do that. And you know, they have normally you have to have a warrant to get that. You know, you can only listen in for so long and such, but. Um, you know, this the whole, the whole. There's nothing legal. They're not going to do anything legal or go by the law when they do something like this, anyway. But sure, they were listening to phone calls, things like that. Yes, because big... oh, yeah. no. I'm, I'm. I want to just um, clarify. Yes, because this was going on for two, three weeks, maybe even longer. So that routing through another phone number can mean a wiretapping. Is that what you're saying? It just, it just they go through with it, any time that it's wiretapping, it's, it's, it's sophisticated wiretapping. It's not a big deal. They can do it with your cell phones and everything. Thank you. It's, it's that, not, thank you for been explaining. A long time. But he, you know, my my thing, my question is, is and I sum it all up, is how sloppy this was, and what, what's made it look, it was a, you know, you know, the cabal, the cabal, or the Saudis, or the jihad, whatever it's, it is, trying to make it look like that, and it's not, it's not, it's not plain for me on that. And the mist, the, the mist rounds its ceiling, the floor, um, his body possibly moving, moved from another place. Um, why pick these guys and not just do it more professionally? I'm trying, that's what I'm kind of stumped at, you know? What if a couple of the people that he was friends with, quote unquote, had mm -hmm. been prior military? Well, without Would naming names, I think. training to I, do I, that? Sure. And without naming names, I think that, that there's at least two of them involved mm -hmm. with this, um, and maybe yeah. maybe and maybe then then a pro. You know, I mean, this wasn't three you know secret agent guys going there to do this for a living. It's too sloppy. Number one, and number two is so, you know, somebody who knows it's easy to get inside. He, he befriended all these people, and you know who, who you're going to trust. And that, that there's definitely one of, one or two of those guys is inside with whomever orchestrated this thing. I believe that, and they probably they paid him some good money. You know, these guys, that they'll go do anything like that. You know, and there's some other things that Greg and I talked about earlier. We can't talk online, but, you know, well, we have our ideas. Oh, thank you. Could thank I... you. I mean, you're making this so much clearer. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. My other question would be, since you have worked as a police officer, uh, the pot... That didn't show up in any of their talk screens. And so, what are you talking so, talk about? Marijuana? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I missed. I, so I missed the, the the narrative on the marijuana. What happened? 
Uh, they did find it at the crime scene. They took photos of it. It's sitting on the dresser, open in the grinder. Uh, the grinder is open, and it's just sitting there. And then there's like mm-hmm. a bag and some tweezers. I think there was a couple bongs, a couple one-hitters in the mm-hmm. bathroom. But they found no pot, no marijuana in either of their systems. They were clean toxicology they, reports. The only thing that was found was Camille had something similar to an aspirin product, but they were completely clear for alcohol and drugs. Sure, you know, the, the marijuana, they might have used it every once in a while, and it's about like 30 days to get out of your system. They're both in pretty good shape. You know, they drink some cranberry juice, and it's gone. Or They're not trying to hide anything. They're just, they weren't avid smokers. That's all, you know. And so a lot of people who believe that David is guilty are using the marijuana as an excuse for him snapping and killing his family. Marijuana doesn't do that. I know. I know. They got the wrong drug. You've never seen that movie well, Reefer Madness? I mean, according to, to that movie, oh, you know, that, that's that, exactly that, what that, that, that is... That, that's, that's, that's so far left, you know that? Oh my God! <laughs> I know, you know, like, like, you know, it's funny. I can't even watch it. It's so stupid. <laughs> it's so, it's so, I, I, I watch half baked ten times before I watch that one. You know, no, that movie, that movie's ter- that movie's terrible. Yeah, yeah, it is. It really is. It's it's funny. But, it's um, funny to watch it every now and then because of how bad it is. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes Greg, I don't, know, I don't, so I don't have patience. Good. Patience for that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you yeah, gotta have feel a sad for yeah. you gotta have a couple couple drinks to watch that one, I'm sure. But Jeez, you know. well, absolutely. Um, <laughs> we had a a, but, a, couple, um, a couple people have asked me, and I don't know, Stephen. I know we've talked about this photo. Have you seen the photo of um, the dog um, of the family dog taken a couple days later? Next to uh, no, I David's haven't. brother, I have not. Seen okay, it. I've had a few people. They want me to make sure that I get you that photo. So I want to make sure that I get you that photo. Um, mm. They just want to hear. Sure. They want to hear your thoughts on that. What kind of, by the way, what, what size? What kind of dog was it? I, I really don't have any idea. It's a medium size half beagle, um, and you know, a very a very friendly dog. And I I it. I, I don't know exactly how I forget the age of it, but it wasn't that old either. But and um, also, it's important to note that in one of the articles online, it stated that at the time when Paleo was taken to the vet, he only weighed roughly 15 pounds and normally was a 20-pound uh, dog. Oh, okay. Then yeah, you know, there's just you know, he didn't consume the hands or limbs. I don't, you know, I might have done a little bit on the skulls, but that the dog didn't gain any weight. You know, the dog, none, none of the entrails were opened up. If the dog was really starving, he, he would have, you know, went into the um, cavity. But he had that food, like, she, like she said, she there's food in the kitchen, which I was unaware of. I thought, you know, but the dog didn't eat worse. the food either. That's the thing. Well, the dog knew what happened. Dog, the dog went into pre- depression. That's what will happen. Okay. Dog, there you uh, go. Yeah, dog, the dog. We know that's just the dog. You know how dogs are so smart. They know something went wrong, and that, that just, you know, I, I watched on, I watched on uh, Facebook, YouTube the other day of the dogs that go to cemeteries three or four years later, and they went for their, their their owner that, that passed away, you know, three years earlier, and they, they still, they know, you know, they know, are... they know, under the grass and everything, so, um, no, dog, dog, I haven't, that doesn't surprise me at all, and the dog, and the dog will hold back, too, from, you know, the dog knows that, you know, it's the last resort, you know, um, so, so uh, you know, if that was that good of a dog, you know. One of the one of the we just got a, a great question in the um, the uh, our chat room too um, ab- about that dog. If if the dog did all of this damage, would there be blood on its mouth? Would there, would there be blood on its paws? Would we expect to to find that? Because th- I think that's why people want you to see this photo because it, there's nothing like sure. that there. Maybe they cleaned it up by that time. You know, maybe they gave the dog. A bath or something, but would would nope. we expect to find that? No. Um, they weren't supposed to do anything with the dog; just feed and water him. That's true. You're right. Depending if the dog did eat some bone and such, I mean, they they'll go ahead and give the dog an enema, and then that's what the first thing you know, as law enforcement, we would do, you know, take the vet, give it an enema, and get out, get the evidence out. 
test you know, it. For digest all the way or what have you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're going to find it's got to go into the feces, and you're going to find you know, human bone in there. You don't, you don't digest bone. Um, Stephen, you know, so the, yeah. oh, I, I wanted you to know that the police, the, the officer who dropped off the dog, explicitly told the, the kennel that they took him to to not do anything to the dog other than provide it food and water only, not anything else. You know, you know what? You want to know that giving a dog an enema doesn't not harm him. I mean, that's that that's just investigations 101. Those 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 cases you know. that you that you talked about, Stephen, about um, how they you know set, what I think you said 73 percent. You know, the the dog eats mm -hmm. the owners. Do they do they mention anything about testing feces or t anything like that in those? Oh. They, that, that no, no, they don't say anything like that. But I mean, that's you would, that's what you would do that, mm. you know, because the dog may may have ate a bullet, you know. I mean, that's happened, I'm sure. You know, the dog swallows eating, eating flesh and actually swallows a bullet. I mean, that's not out, that's not out of the realm by any means. So now oh. we're missing a bullet. Oh, you know, oh. sex with the dog. Yeah. I have to I have to jump in here because that's exactly what they the narrative I'm sorry I'm so excited you're bringing this stuff up and it's like that's exactly the narrative they were trying to say that the fragments were still inside the skull and so the dog ate it all and so they that's why they disappeared and they couldn't find it but yet they didn't test the dog or any of the feces they just said oh, yeah, that they yeah, yeah and no, the door was cracked, but the dog couldn't get out. Is that correct? Correct. It was one fourth inch. Oh. Mm. Yeah. So there'd be all the feces inside. I'd collect that evidence. It'd be you know automatic. Oh yeah, absolutely. They they would just roll. You know, they'll, 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 something like that to take the whole rug, just roll it up and take it and, and, to, and forensic the rug. I mean. And they took know, none of it. Yeah, yeah, I can see the feces in the picture. You know. Yeah, they took none of it. They tested none of it. Well, if they would have taken that And the search warrant rug. did cover that. Yeah, that's true. So they could have legally done it. Oh, oh, they could do everything, you know. Um, I'm I'm kind of surprised, if, even though it's a sloppy hit. I, mean, I I truly truly believe that just it wasn't a couple of friends who who got high and drunk. Is that um, were the computers and all that kind of stuff? Then you know they would have went in there and cleaned it up earlier. I I don't I don't know, you know. Um, maybe that's it's better to leave them to go ahead and decompose. You know, I don't know about that. That's just that's why I question a couple of things like that. Um, they usually go in there with the crime scene and pull computers out of something involved that's, um, you know, the government wants. Right, Greg? I would think so. I would think so. Yeah, they did with Philip Marshall. You know, pull yeah, the, out right away. The whole, the whole, um, the whole weed, and I don't know. It, you, uh, it sounds like maybe we need to show you the photos of how that weed was actually laid out in there bedroom it's it's not too similar but it's not that much different from phil marshall because that was one of the first things that the cops jumped on there too is that phil had weed out mm -hmm. um this was even worse this looks like they were grinding it somebody mm. knocked on their door they kind of stopped and then these murders happened okay it looks well, staged. This, this, it looks staged. well this, this, this is this is why marijuana is a schedule one one drug uh, according to um, the government, and, and it will never be changed. It's the only way, you, you know, they know a lot, so many people smoke marijuana, but it is the last way they can get into your house for just smoking marijuana. And that's why it's a Schedule One drug with cocaine and, and acid and things like that. Um, mush, mushrooms, Schedule One. Mm -hmm. But marijuana is a Schedule One drug. It shouldn't be there. Why? Because that gives the feds all the power in the world to go in there. It, it, it's a felony, of, you know, a federal felony for uh, over 99 plants. The, the feds can go in there and take over. You know, I mean, if they want to, but you know, cultivating federally is illegal. So you know that, and it, it doesn't save the guy any more faces. That stuff. It's more of a probable cause. Hey, they can back it with, hey, this guy, this guy sells marijuana. You know, and then they'll, they'll they'll post hence the warrant and get some crooked judge to sign, backdate it, and say, you know, we thought he was this, and he pulled a gun on us. You know, mm -hmm. that's how they that's how they work that. But it's a definitely a, it's definitely a default for the federal government, which is probably involved in this. Um, and you know, and it probably made it look for like his possession for sale, like he was bigger, like a bigger dealer, you know. Yeah, yeah, Stephen, can you see can you see the photos Greg's running right now? No, you know what? I'm, I'm just on a um, 
other, oh, other okay. computer, so I don't have it all up. Okay. Because I, I, I was going to let Greg know which photo number was the, the, the pot on the dresser, but that won't help you, so never mind. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that. We, 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 we can... We can we could do a you know a curtain call later for fifteen minutes if we have a you know bunch of stuff we found out you know. Sure. That sounds great, and I truly appreciate you taking the time tonight to discuss this with us. Oh no, thank you. We I, do I, have I, two I just, questions. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. That well, first you guys did a great job because I picked up on a lot of things that I missed. Um, thanks to Greg, got me a lot of good information. I was trying to think. I had a couple more things here. I went over the impression on the handwriting. Which you know that you know reading through that tells me that he knew you know some something was going to go on. Um, uh, dishwasher. I, one of the biggest things is just how, you know so many places where blood there was, where there was blood you know touched or moved or whatever you know. And the first thing I thought was oh you know the poor guy is beat he's walking around you know he's stumbling in the kitchen there'd be a lot more blood than that. So somebody was you know here you are. One, having only one little fingerprint by the sink and in the dishwasher, a little bit of blood, um, it tells me that came off of one of the suspects. Not, you know, maybe I'll, maybe a cut off. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, oh yeah I think goodness. it was a fire. I was going to ask you about okay, that. That's, <laughs> that's well, that, the first, the only thing that, don't, listen, they got to his gun. The only thing David had probably was the knife. And I know when I had a situation, I didn't, you know, go anywhere in my house with a, with a pretty nice sized blade because people get in. I didn't, you know, I don't carry a gun around all that stuff, but just a little bit of an edge, and that's how he thought. And he's probably really good with that knife. Um, and it won't, you know, daughter's not going to shoot herself. He can lay it on the table. It's, you know, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a firearm hazard. And um, the guy who, you know, there's, there should be. If, if this was any, if, if this was David, his wife, or his daughter, if they went into the kitchen and there was one drop of blood, it would be a flood. You know, I mean, just the way well, they were wounded, shot, hurt, whatever. David, you know, basically done the fight, cut the guy, the guy went in there, and there's very little drops of blood, like maybe he sliced his hand a little bit, washed it down the sink. You know, you, know, so the, you are saying exactly what the deputy I spoke with said, and also the um, deputy coroner, the sheriff's deputy, and then the deputy coroner said exactly the same thing. They said that blood in the kitchen was more than likely belonged to the perpetrator or perpetrators, and right. it should have been tested. And they asked me, that was the first thing they said, was that tested? And I said no, and they said that was a huge mistake. No, I, that, that that's one of the things that caught my eye. It was just there, there should be no blood or a lot of blood, okay? And then we got a couple of drops. I mean, you know, you go in and the guy was going to wash his wound out. If it's only a few drops and he left them, I'm sure he didn't, you know, they didn't, wanna, they didn't have to clean up anything, you know? So even if he had a rubber glove on, which makes sense because it's going to hold some blood back. So they, they had latex gloves on. Sure of that, all right? Because I'm yep. sure they're... they're yep. So you're still cutting the latex gloves, you know? Yeah, so... You know, David probably got you know a punch in, you know, and a knife, and you know, got the guy, cut the guy a little bit, and then they, they maybe shot him from there, or hit him, they hit him in the head with the, you know, what object did they hit him in the head with? I mean, you can do a number with a gun, the butt of a pistol, you could cave a guy's head in if you had to. I don't necessarily see that, but um, there's, there's not enough blood everywhere else to be David or anybody else who was who was killed. Right, right. Because wasn't it the computer that looked like it had? One, one uh, like a smudge, but it was like a latex. Yeah, that, that's yeah, and that was in the kitchen, right? Yes. Well, it was on the right. uh, island. It was on the island, right? So it's by the sink, but in the kitchen. So that guy touched mm -hmm. this, this, dripped a little bit. He was going probably across toward the sink, and his his hand graced over the computer in a little little drop or something. But that tells me definitely. You guys are right on on that. That's the, it's the suspect's blood. And that excuse me. And there was a knife. There's blood on the knife. So you know they probably used it against David maybe also, but the blood the blood in the kitchen is, is uh, if they tested that it wouldn't be David's. Yeah, the knife is the only thing in in that in in that crime scene. Not the gun, not the magazine, not any of the um, spent cartridges, or not even the bullet fragments. But the knife is the only item that had blood detected from David, Kamel, and Rania, and the police didn't even believe that that was important enough to even make part of the investigation. It was found open with the blade pointing down, the, the tip of the blade pointing down toward David's feet, and here it was open on the floor next to David, and 
had, was the only thing that had all three of their blood on it, and yet it was never part of the investigation. Yeah, no, they they they, they, they stabbed those people too, I'm sure. Um, or they used it, and it, they might have used it to cut part of the hands. I don't know, but um, it, the blood we you know we we could yep. suffice that the blood blood around the sink and stuff you know is 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 uh, suspects. Yes, which makes sense. Yeah, because if they're, and when you look at that piece of the skull with the with the um, skin and the scalp still attached, you see straight lines. And I'm sorry, a dog pulling a scalp off is not going to leave a straight line. It was, it was something was used to to make a straight line to remove that from David's head. And since there's a knife on scene, I'm going to just jump in here and make that assumption that the knife was used to then cut that the scalp away from David's head. And at that point, whether they're stabbing David or trying to cut off hands, we don't know. That's a pretty good assumption. But we do see straight cuts and straight lines on the scalp. But they, with a lot of people don't understand how slippery blood is and how easy it is if you're trying to cut something and you've got blood all over how easy it is to slice your own hand and so that sure. is my take and how then that blood was then transferred by a passive manner they slice their hand and trying to cut and so then they're then going to the kitchen to wash sure. their hands off and then it's dropping well no but the thing is is if he went in there and just cut the scalp. He'd have more blood on his hands than three drops. That that blood was cut. I'm guessing more that the knife wound was when David had a knife and he got a little licking and they hit him over the head and that was it. So David had cut the perp. Cutting the scalp, you're gonna have blood all over your. I mean, there's a you know, gloves. Take them off, you know, but there's still gonna be more blood if he didn't take them off. I don't know. They didn't find gloves laying around. So it tells me is that um, the, the blood probably was from a David, you know defending himself maybe more so than cutting a scalp maybe you know the scalp could have been cut afterwards uh okay know, the, sure okay that that yeah. makes sense thank you there's not enough yeah there's not enough blood in, in anywhere else besides the living room that that impresses me huh? that's you know just a very superficial wound if anything we've all probably done worse than that just cutting tomatoes you know <laughs> really i mean you know terrible but yeah that's what i think yeah. Let's see. Well, once again, I'm really grateful that we've had a chance to speak with you tonight and well, that everybody else has had it. Sophia. Oh, Sophia, okay. I remember mm -hmm. you came on, I thought we lost you earlier, and maybe I thought it was somebody else. Sophia, okay, great. And Catherine, right? Catherine. Yeah, that's me. And I, we I, do have some questions for you, but we'd like to ask you privately in regards. Yeah, sure. We can we can go off air. Yeah, no problem. Everything, you know, excuse me. Everything's confidential because, you know, if this goes big, you know, everybody, those of us who come up, you, you know, I mean, people can laugh. You're putting your life on the line, okay? And uh, Greg has done it. I've done it. You guys are doing it. Um, you know, the, you know, the, it, they start targeting. They listen in. They'll see when the threat's a real threat. You know, we're not out there writing books and, and preaching and selling snake oil, right? But you know, everybody's doing this. Alex Jones is still alive. So if Alex Jones is still alive. <laughs> I think we're okay, but we still take it seriously yeah. uh, to keep it confidential, right? Right. We've all had to move in regards to this case. Yes, we did. Oh, really? Yes, we did. Oh, really? oh no. <laughs> oh, and God. that I'll, I'll, yes, we'll, we'll decide. Why would what we have to do that? What into? <laughs> Greg, Greg, what, do you got, what have we gotten into? <laughs> all part oh, of that. Hey, <laughs> You know what I say, Greg? When I signed up with you, I signed up for the best. So I'll, right. I'll go with you guys, okay? Awesome. But, uh, but Stephen, you, know, you have to understand that we'll all just grab a glass of wine and stand around a fire and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that, 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 that only gets you drunk. Okay, so right. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, we could do better than that. Scotch. <laughs> no. Scotch. Okay. <laughs> That's too funny. We got some great. Uh, I I want to give a shout to everybody in our in our chat room too. Thank you all for for joining us here. And um, again, um, so many different things that are going on in our in our chat. Lots of great lots of great points being being made. So um, uh, make sure that uh, keep making those points, and I'll try to get to some of those too. Uh, we had one that was made uh, about the um, the locks on those doors. So uh, some of some of the doors look like maybe the locks are brand new. I know we had talked about a uh, 
a gentleman named Sean Wright. And Sean Wright, when um, this whole case first broke, he told Dan Hannon that the police actually kicked in the front door. Now we know that that's not true. It's not mentioned any in any place. But you know, it's just uh, it's just one one of the things, one of the more reasons why you can't consider a person like that a credible source. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of things like that where people were telling us, no, this is what happened, and then we get the actual documents, and you can clearly see, no, none of that happened. Um, so they just lied, and there's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of people out there that are just lying, that are just basically making stuff up, that are trying to trick people. And so that's another reason why I love doing these, these calls. That's why we have so many great people in our chat room who really care, who really want to, to find out what, what really happened here. And I think, um, I think one day we, we will definitely, um, we, will, we will find out. And of course, the goal is to reopen this case. And so, Stephen, if you have any thoughts, any suggestions on that, um, we definitely want to talk about that at a later time, too. Um, and any uh, tips, if there's anybody out there listening or watching this that has any tips, uh, any ways that we could further that, I think that is our main goal. Dan Hannon hired a private investigator by the name of Kenneth Maines, and uh, it pretty much... You know, Kenneth Maines, he wasn't really hired. The problem was he, Kenneth Maines wasn't hired as a private investigator. He was hired to give his thoughts and uh, give his views on this, this case. And we thought that Kenneth Maines was going to take all of the documents, everything that Dan gave him, and add to it, not just look at it and pretty much, you know, take away everything that had questions and only talk about the stuff that the police said. Basically, Kenneth Maines was just saying why the police got, got things right. And there's a lot of questions there. There was a lot of problems there, but um, we are always looking for a private investigator to kind of help us go f to, to go further. I think, you know, in the, in the five years that we've been here, we've collected a lot of data, some public, some private, but there's, I mean, if it, just with the public data, it just seems, it's just kind of baffling how, um, you know, how, why nobody has been able to take this up. I think the reason why the law enforcement hasn't been able to do anything with this is they don't really, really know. I think a lot of them just do not know, or maybe they just do not care. But to me, this always seemed like a very slam dunk case. So I was really really shocked that there wasn't more effort put into um, trying to understand who killed this five-year-old daughter the, and this couple. Well, all, I mean, both were 28 years old, 29 years old. These are very, very young people that had everything going for them. And when you, when you factor it in that David Crowley was a soldier serving in Iraq and Afghanistan during that, those hot wars, during that hot time, um, there were also questions. Maybe that's what got him into trouble. Um, motive. The motive, Stephen, if you were to look for motive from David or from anybody as a police officer or as a private investigator, what would you look for? Well, they're automatically going to look for life insurance policies on, on each other. That's, that's number one, and, and cancel that out pretty quickly on this. Um, I'm thinking it was done by the rookies, the people that know him, it's close to him. Um, like I said, it's too sloppy. Um, and like Philip Marshall, they killed a dog. They would have probably done the same thing here. The curtains were open. Those would have been closed. Um, that's, a, that's a simple move. And um, I a question, there was, a, there was a GoFundMe that, that went up for a while, and it looked like somebody absconded some of the money. Yeah, that was David's David's brother put up a GoFundMe. Um, do you guys remember? Was it, it was like sixty million dollars or six 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 million dollars for Kamel's mom? Kamel's mom. Yeah, he was asking for six million. For You're six correct. million dollars, and um, uh, and, and it was weird that he made it for Kamel's mom, who had cancer, some type of can I forget what type of cancer mm -hmm. she had, and so once 
Kamel's family found out, they had him shut that thing down. So that was a weird, mm-hmm. weird thing. And I think that's when a lot of questions started pointing towards the brother. That, well, why is this right. guy... Not not necessarily saying that, that the brother killed his brother or anything, but why is this guy doing this? Why, why would he ever set up um, this GoFundMe for somebody that he doesn't know and for so much money? And then raise $8,000 and, you know... I'm not sure what he did. I don't have any facts, any um, facts to show what he did with that eight thousand dollars. I can just say that we we can definitely show that he raised eight thousand dollars. Hopefully, he gave it back to all those oh, people yeah. who. Oh who no! You know what? I, I I remember reading something about him going to Las Vegas. He did go to Las Vegas right after that, or right during that that time. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so. That's um, where the money went. Yeah, that was that was kind of well. He was doing that because he needed to get out. You know, he wanted to just. I mean, come on. If if your brother's dead, you know, you're probably gonna want to go and do some something else too, right? I mean, you're not just gonna want to just shelter in your in in your home. I know I I wouldn't. Well, yeah. I mean, but what, what was the money supposed to go to? Uh, burial services or something? No, it was supposed to help out Camille's Camille's mom with her cancer treatments and how much did she you know not how much did she get he still shouldn't have went to las vegas she, she didn't i mean she didn't even know she didn't even know that any of this was actually happening yeah you know I, of course yeah, she no, he, he probably yes yeah, she didn't find out yeah, about these deaths for, for a long time afterwards but yeah i mean mm-hmm. th- his actions you know and, and it's like well you can't even you can't even say that his actions were odd because then people are going to think that we're saying that you know that that the brother yeah. killed the brother and the dad's covering it up because the dad doesn't want to lose another son. Yeah, you know, it gets into all of that stuff, and and it's oh, like oh yeah, what, what what about dropping the Christmas presents off? You know, not you know the curtains were supposed to be open. He would have peeked in. You know? Curtains were open, right? Correct. Yeah, and he he dropped presents off without seeing them, but the curtains are open. Wouldn't you kind of like if after you knock or well, he didn't knock. He said it would be a surprise, which you know I don't. He and his, he and his brother are a lot closer than that. And you know you you, you, always, you don't just leave them on the front no on, on the back porch or what have you, you no know? you don't no. that's that's, that's, that's that to me just you know I don't know what the purpose is that to throw somebody off on this or say hey I was by at that time and you know it's it's some sort of alibi he's working you know worming worming around there um, was he seen by other people well could that have know? been to also well, set him up to make sure that he keeps his mouth quiet David's brother. I mean, in which way? Well, I mean, why was you know that kind of makes him look him look bad? Like, why was he there? What you know? Oh, sure. What is he doing there? Him, him, he, and his brother are not talking at that at that point. He's trying to. Oh, they weren't. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's okay. some family beef. You know, I, I don't think it was that much different than you know any family squabbling because um, when David got a new phone, I believe in November or October. Um, nobody else David's parents didn't have his his new phone number David gave it to his brother first so whatever beef that the brothers had and of course I'm I'm totally biased because I love my brothers I love my my sisters I I can never fathom anything like that trying to take myself out of that and put myself into the situation where a brother could do that has been challenging it's been a big challenge because it's hard for me to understand how that could even happen how that could be even possible but those things do happen obviously but can i can yeah, i interject please. something really quick here greg uh, going back to the 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 presence is where i have an issue with dan jr is that he states and makes his um, um statement to the police where he says that he dropped the gifts off on december 25th was it or the twenty somewhere around the twenty eighth? The twenty eighth. He told. Police. Okay, and the whole thing was is he says he dropped them off then, but when the the neighbors were interviewed, without exception, without exception, every single neighbor stated in their 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 testimony to the police is that they did not notice anything on the porch until January tenth. Yeah, nobody saw him dropping the gifts off or anything. And so really, they supposedly sat there from the 28th until the 10th 
and the and every single neighbor missed it. But no, every neighbor stated, and they didn't know. They didn't know that they were telling the police the same story. You know, all of the neighbors are like, so when did you notice the gifts? Well, January 10th. I think it was only one neighbor that actually even No, there were a couple of them. Was there a couple? Because uh, I, I know the guy who, who was across the street who, who was pretty much the last person to see David, I believe on Christmas Eve, um, he said he didn't notice those presents until January 7th, until January 17th when the bodies were found. And I question him even being able to see David because looking at the house and how they're, <laughs> you're going to laugh, I know, uh, but when you look at how these houses are situated on Google Maps and you can look corner to corner, house to house, when you're looking at those street views and the houses are so offset and there's a tree there, there I do not see. I'm going to, I challenge that man to explain to me how he saw David and how he looked David in the eye when they're kitty corner and their their windows aren't even um, in the same line of sight. Yeah. Yeah. See, I believed that story when I had read it in the police reports, but then when I saw the Google photos and then the layout of their neighborhood, I was like, "Oh, there's something wrong with this." Yep. Because, yeah, there's. Yeah, that just doesn't make sense. And then on top of that, this person who claims to have seen David has David's birthday, and then his wife has Camille's birthday. And he's he's tall. He's about seven seven feet tall, if I remember. Almost seven feet tall. So he's a pretty tall tall guy. And he disappeared, moved away right after he was interviewed or talked to for the first time. He he left. And that, that, never left a forwarding address. Well, we thought that he le- he told police that he left, but then it turns out that that he didn't leave actually. So I don't know why he told police that, or why whoever <laughs> police talked to when they came back, um, you know, why did they think that he had he had moved when Dan Hinnon spoke with that person? It was pretty pretty clear that he had not moved. He was still there, still living there. Um, so that was. That was definitely odd. Um, but the the other question is, why did police go back a second time to go talk to that person too? So that's never really, I've never really felt good about a clear answer about why the police went back for a second time. What type of questions were they going to ask the person across the street? Okay, so the the... Okay, because I'm basing what I just stated on what was in the report. Correct. So, that's right. And so that is erroneous information because Dan did speak with them and they did state that they were still there after the police stated that they believed he had moved and he was no longer at that address. I, I have to, we'd have to clarify with Dan if the neighbor stated that, but we definitely know that the neighbor did not move at that time when uh, the officer Tara Becker went back to talk with that neighbor, uh, she was told that they had actually moved, or that, no, that she was told that they were no longer at the residence. And then it definitely came out later on that he was at the residence. So that's, that's all that I know for sure. We'd, we'd have to get Dan to clarify if the neighbor told him that or if that's something that was found elsewhere okay thank you because I'll, I'll change my notes then on that so yeah. I, I mean I want all the the right information thank you Greg sure um, so I, I had kind of asked why he went to Vegas and uh, somebody in the chat said for gambling pansy said that for gambling uh, mm-hmm. somebody noticed the dog hair was Didn't stuck he... in in the blood on the gun um, I don't know if that was dog hair on the gun but there was some type of hair on the gun and, uh, and blood. Greg, that would that that would answer with the blunt force trauma to his skull was a butt of the of the pistol. That's that's what, that's what I was gun. thinking yeah. too. But I I don't know if yeah. Catherine you mm-hmm. know Catherine's the one who actually brought that up and yeah um, I did I did a lot of research and a, and a lot of looking into that and you um, I have a really good uh, software um, program. I used to do photography. So I ran these photos and the skull piece through my photography uh, development programs. And when you, um, 
when I get different views, you can actually see impressions that are um, like a square or a triangle with a small circle in the middle. There's like two or three separate impressions um, that you can clearly see different designs on. Um, um, I'll send them to Greg, or if you still have them, Greg, if you could pass them on to Stephen, that would be great. Yeah. And I would love for you to take a look at these photos, and then you can see what I see. It's not the butt of a gun. I'm not saying he wasn't hit with the butt of a gun because he absolutely could have been, but you see impressions, like what makes a diamond shape, what makes a hexagonal shape, what makes um, a, um, uh, a square with a circle in the middle. There's like three separate tools I found. Three separate. Well, I'm calling them okay. tools. I don't know if they are tools, but okay. three separate yeah, those, indentation those, those, designs. Yeah, but there is definitely well, that, that, okay. There's definitely that, well, something. You, uh, something happened with yeah. the butt of of that gun. Sorry, Stephen. Go ahead. Oh no, no. I say it was um. You know, they didn't just pick it up by the barrel and hit people. Also, poking it hard into his head, like really hard. That'll that'll give you a square with a circle in the middle. That's the barrel. Okay, so they'll, they'll shove it into his head too. They hit him with, and, and if you see the diamond, yeah. uh, that, that could possibly be the grips. The, you know, taking it and just hit him and whack him in the side of the head with holding the barrel. And the grip, they usually, they, they, there's, uh, there's diamond handled um, 45s. Okay, yeah. just so you know, it's like a, a, a larger size diamond shape. When you use it and you measure it with the little sticker tape that they have, it's like a quarter of an inch to a half an inch, just one diamond shape. That, that's, that'd be, it'd be the diamond inside the grips. It'll, it'll be protruded a little bit, um, but I've seen them before. It could be, I, that, that, it could be something else, too, a part okay. of the gun, but, um, but I would take a look at that. I'd take a look at, if I could see the grips. It would, you know, either negated or to tell us that might be it. But the, bit, right. the square, the square with the circle is a barrel being pushed into your skull. Okay, great, thank you. Well, because um, and the reason why I, I'm in again, I, <laughs> I'm not arguing. I'm just throwing this out there because when when I spoke with the deputy coroner, um, they stated that, and I had asked him, could it be a gun? And they said they didn't think so. But again, they didn't see the picture of the gun either. But if you could look at the picture of the gun and then the barrel, because they do have that, I believe they have that photograph, and then compare that with the photos I'll send you via Greg of the impressions, then I think you'll have a better understanding. And you can give, well, at least help me understand, all of us, a more informed um, um, opinion or um, idea. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, let's see. We've talked about the motive, what to look for with motive, all the things the dog was responsible for. Um, how long could it take to publicly state that this was a double murder suicide? Um, have you seen cases, Stephen, about, you know, like the cases that you've studied with a suicide, whether it's real or whether it's not? Um, does that happen fairly quickly within 20, 24 hours of finding these bodies, or is uh, do you think that that's normal? Because uh, at least from f within four hours to twenty four hours, the police were going with the theory that this was that David Crowley was guilty. Mm -hmm. Seems kind of quick. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm just looking at photographs and such, and you know, trajectory of bullets. Um, blood, blood in different places. Mm -hmm. the, the the pose of the bodies, the hands, the arms, everything. And it's not one. This is not the work of David. Period. It's, that's you know. It's, it's, no, there's no way. You know, absolutely not. It's too much there for one guy to do all that. Just look at the whole picture. I mean, usually it's boom, boom, and boom. That's it. It's not tracking around blood and blood on computers and everything else. There's no way. He didn't wound him. He didn't. He didn't gravely wound himself, I don't think, and walked around touching a computer and sink and dishwasher because it would be, like I said, it would have been flooded with blood. So there's, there's, no, there's absolutely no way that he did this. No way. Yeah, and Too many I, do, moving parts there, Greg. Do, do you see any signs that he, that, that he snapped, that he could have snapped and, and, and went crazy? Do I, you I, see that? I, I, see, I see some signs, I won't lie to you. I see on Facebook, later the, post, the post got later toward his demise that they were more de 
I can see depression in him a little bit, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, but not too much earlier than that. You know, he seemed fine on that. And you know, I see the I see the, the um, statements on the internet and people talking about it, you know, and you know, he didn't kill himself because he didn't get his movie. You know, I mean, and you know, he didn't sacrifice his wife and child to Sharia law or jihad or the cabal it wasn't, no. And, and, you know, and just, I don't, I've never seen anybody get shot in the back of the head and then lay out on their back, crucifix, crucifixial style. There's, there's no way. It's, it's, it's the whole thing, it's, there's, there's symbolism here. Like, like I told you when I looked up the, the um, symbol of hands being taken off, I'm not talking about, you know, Argentina or the mob or anything. Um, I'm talking about in a, in a ritual and such in Sharia Sharia law. Um, there, there's, it's about humanity, you know, and that's that's, um, that's the symbol they use, and it's, and it's it's on the internet. You can see that, the, you know, and it's kind of going along with with the, with the narrative of some of this anyway. But anybody could look that up and, and copycat that also. Yeah. And I think it's important for to to state here that there was at least one of the other people that was close to this family at the time who was very well versed and um, in the Muslim religion and um, actually looked to be practicing it themselves. Mm, okay. There's definitely some ties to that in there. It just, it's, I just don't think David did, did all that, you know? And they, they didn't test some of the other blood and, and such. Maybe we're in the notebooks, and you know, and the things he wrote, you know, um, the impressions on the on the writing, you know, under undercover, you know, mentioning that he's in danger for undercover. It's, that's not from a man who's going to self-inflict his family and such. You know, it talks that maybe he has he's seen guys parked outside his house, maybe or something. Right. You know, um, yeah. Talking about that in in dented writing. Um, it was interesting that the in in the indented writing is only mentioned on two pages. Uh, so the, the the question was, do you know, does that show that the indented writing was only on these two pages, or uh, is it possible that the indented writing was also on other pages, but again, just weren't tested like so many other things? Yeah, I mean, if you depends on how hard you press, you can get down to like a second copy. You can still read, you know, but usually it's the first one's best. Where's the original copy at? You know, why um, was it taken out? It maybe threw it, maybe it maybe threw it away. Why did he pull it off? But you know, didn't put it. It wasn't a post-it. You know, um, but the, the three three of the three of the um, statements that they that, that they could get to that I could read, mm-hmm. uh, kind of told me he, he just knew something was going on, just like. With, Gary Webb and Philip Marshall and all those guys. There's a point they seem to be about right with their with their guests. It goes you know far as they can just to that tipping point where you know now I better pack a gun or a knife or you know change my number or, or an email goes out to somebody like Mark like Matt um, like um, Michael Hastings to the to one of the guys in the mil- military he was embedded with over in uh, the, in Desert Storm saying I, I'm splitting in the next within two days these guys are dead. Right. You know they know they know they they they, they, they you know these guys I mean, I've smelt it. You just know when it's, you know, you can't prove anything up till then, but it just, and he knew. I really believe that. He, you know, he, he, he had, he had, he had classif- he had a, you know, classifications and some secrecies and stuff. Yeah. And there was, there was the question yeah. of, was he leaving to go to California? Um, we got thrown, we were, people had tried to throw us off of the whole film trail by telling us that David's film was was dead, it was not happening, he was sad, and that's why he did this. We later found out, Dan, Dan Hannon later found out that th- that was not true, that there was a working deal up until the day David Crowley died. So once we realized that, it's like, well, why would people try to throw us off of that trail? And so then it's like, okay, well, obviously you gotta, you, you gotta follow that trail. Um, was it possible that David was was uh, planning on leaving and going to California, to Southern Southern Cal? And uh, because if you're going to make a TV series, which is is what he was doing, he was going to uh, be involved to make Gray State a TV series. You can't do that from Minnes- from Minnesota. You got to be in Cali. 
That's just mm-hmm. you know. I think you, you, you really do. You really got to. You got to be in L.A. Really. You got to be. I know. There. I know those yeah. things. I mean, the closer you are, the, the more tension. And you know, and it's just they, they put a lot of money in these projects. They want the writers or creators to be there. Um, but you know, there's a side of like you wrote books. There's still a gratification whether you, you didn't you didn't write it for the money. You know, I didn't write my book for the money. Um, that it's you got a legacy out there, and you know, just as documentary, choppy or not, it was great. You know, I watched it. You know, and that's pretty satisfying by itself. Right. You know, so I, I don't think it, the depression. Oh, he didn't get his movie. I don't. Plus, the guy's a hard charger. He's not going to give up. He didn't give up in the Middle East and two tours. He's not going to give up his family for for a screenplay. I mean, that's you know, movie. I mean, I'm, that's I've tried to do that in my book. It's not easy, but you know, it's the hardest thing in the world. But he knew that. You know, he had, he had, had a subject matter. You know. We also have proof that uh, he was thinking about moving to California. Actually, Ocean View. Uh, because mm. there is a mortgage company that ran his credit several times, mm. even once after uh, they were dead. Uh, but mm. I think that was just an automatic thing. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but uh, they were. They don't. They, yeah, they, they only. They only been in that house about a year, right? That's right. The one they were in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Sure. He, he was making yeah. the right move. And I saw that he was sell. I saw something about him selling off some. Military gear. Yeah, yeah. saw that. Yeah. So that makes sense. Maybe he's trying to get some cash, help out the move. You know, that makes sense. Stuff he doesn't need right now. Sure. Mhm. Yep. Yeah, he was selling off the the military gear that was being used to make the movie because he wasn't going to need it anymore. It was going to be done in Hollywood. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they rent all that stuff. They get those those houses that do that. They get everything. Yeah. Sure. In his partnership like with Mitch Child, he was trying to get uh, Danny August Mason to sign off Mm -hmm. also. So he was trying to take care of things so that they could possibly leave. Yeah, it's all all planning for for his future, not planning for his end. Right. That's exactly what I think. I mean, you get, I just know, you know, I've got a couple bites of my stuff and it doesn't even work out, but you know, when you get them, I mean, you drop everything. It's fantastic. You know, and, you, and once you get that taste, he, he, yeah, he was going for reasons. He, was, he wasn't going to quit. And that's kind of where some of the questions about some of the other guys that he was working with come in because he was working on rebuilding a quote-unquote trust, trustworthy team and a, a new team. So all of these people that have been with him from – uh, 2011, maybe even 2010, a lot of them were not going to be, uh, all of them were not going to be involved in this TV series that David Crowley was actually making. No, no, the, no, the, 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 um, the producers and the, the distributors and everything, when I did, when I did Bounty Hunters the same way, I didn't even get credits the first year because the producers put it in and the distributors said, well, wait we'll till he earns it. And it's the same thing. You can't. They got the crews down there. Those, those guys do nothing for his deal. They, and they, they probably maybe broke the news to him. Guys, I'm sorry. I'll send you some residuals or royalties or something. But you can't go with me. And that, that's the way it is. Right. He is. He, he only has. You only have so much juice when you're doing something like that. You know, they're putting the money up, and that's a final say for a great story. They don't need anybody else. Like you know, they wouldn't need anybody else for, if you're from you know, from your book, the Bohemian Club stuff. Right. They don't need anybody else. They got your story. You know. So um, that, that's that's how it works. Yeah. And Greg, you brought up an interesting point because when he was writing Jason Allen about, you know, creating a a new team and stuff like that, he made sure to include Kamel. That's true. And for those saying that he was narcissistic and all he thought about was himself and everything, he would not have included her in that as part of his team. He would have taken all the credit. They, they, they'll, they'll give you when it's a wife or somebody like that. They'll, they'll definitely give you that credit. They'll, they won't. They don't want to lose a project over that. But a bunch of you know drinking buddies and stuff, or even guys who did the first documentary, you know that they, they don't need them. There's, there's there's nothing they can do. And that's that's how the business works. So, yeah, they'll they'll, they'll, they'll sign on the wife. If that's part of the deal. That that's not a that's not a big stretch. And it's a, it's a it's a good thing. Thank you. Yeah, and that was um, December, right, Sophia? Yeah, that was late. That yeah, I think Jason Allen. That was one of his last emails, if I remember correctly. And Catherine, do you remember the last time that David made a phone or a text? It was November. the middle of November, right? Um, 
let's see. Oh, girl, you're taxing my brain. Um, I thought for, yeah, I, okay, I might have them mixed up. One of them, it was the middle of November, and the other, it was like December 15th. But communication for sure, but then again, oh, this nice. was stuff that was coming through their phones, but everything was stopped and no calls were returned, no texts were sent out. I think the last one was December 15th. Yeah, I have here. Um, and I think that was Camille. Yeah. For Camille, for for I think David. You're, I think you're right. For David. I'm sorry, it, Greg. What? Sorry, for for David, it was on uh, the 26th of November was the last day yep. that a okay. phone call was made from David's cell phone at 6:51 p.m. The call lasted 58 seconds. I don't remember who it was to, but that means... Midas. Oh, right, right, the Midas. And not the gold Midas, but the, for his tires. And mm -hmm. uh, again, if you're going to take a road trip, if you're going to go from Minnesota to, Cali to California, you're going to want to make sure you got good tires. Mm -hmm. Well, it was also Minnesota in the winter. I mean, it's very possible he could have been wanting to put some new tires on true because of winter true very true the only other time that we have communication with david i believe it was just with jason allen in december and that was an email yeah we don't even know if david wrote that it's it's supposition okay. on our part yeah and uh with Correct. his lawyer david was talking with his lawyer um in these December too, around that time. Computer was email, or was through yes, through his email, through his Gmail. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, then um, maybe he did write the letter to Jason Allen. I would think so. I would. I would hope so. You know, it was. It well, was it's bad. possible. I'm just saying we don't know because. It's an it's an email, you know, until they can actually, you know, prove either prove it or disprove it. It's it's a supposition on both ends. True. Which they should be able to once because they had yes what twelve terabytes of David's data. They had all of, all of this stuff. The police are looking for motive, um, and they don't find it. There isn't any. So that's Correct. that's clear, but without motive, why uh, accuse David Crowley guilty? The problem is before they even had motive, before they had anything, within 24 hours, they were already telling us David Crowley was was guilty. What are the chances of them changing their mind and saying, "Oh, you know what? We got that wrong. Sorry." Don't hear that a lot from cops, unfortunately, <laughs> which is fine because they are people. You know, they're they're people too. They people they 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 can they can mess up. And uh, that was one of the things when I uh, with the twenty one questions for Detective Gummert, That was one of the things that really bothered me. You know, they weren't even willing to admit that they messed up. I would have been able, you know, I would have said, well, we're not going, it's, this is not a, a liable case. You know, I'm not trying to put you guys under the gun. I'm just trying to understand your theory. That's all that I've ever wanted to really do. Why, how do cops go into a house, look at the scene, and as soon as they look at this scene, think David Crowley is guilty? That's not good. That's not good. Because that could be anybody. You know, that could be their family. I'm sure if it was their family members, maybe they put a little more effort into it. I would hope so. But um, that's just one of the things that has bothered me. Um, what other questions anybody else have? I, I still got a few here. I have a question. In your line of duty, and even as the PI and everything, have you come across a whole lot of cases where the police have covered up not not a whole lot but a few absolutely oh yes no doubt and have they ever corrected themselves or nope if they've been called out on it or do Usually they just... 
you know, most of them that I, I handled were very high profile that, that did that. Um, and they seem to, most of them seem to be connected in the valley in California up through the mother load. Um, uh, it seems that, you know, there's corruption everywhere. And everybody can you know, say, you know, same with there's certain drugs everywhere, but it's not true. You know, there's, there's areas that are, you know, hotbeds. And um, there's, we, we got, well, we have, we have a case we can discuss later. A new one Greg and I talked about was Philip Hay. Uh, Haynes, Philip Haynes, Haney. but um, Haney. Haney, Philip Haney, thank you, Greg. I'm, I'm a rookie on that one too. <laughs> but um, the the cover-ups and, and the motivation behind it is usually always a, a, a power players that are in the drug business. And uh, yeah, I've seen the cover-ups. I mean, even in my book, I talk about how I was I was set up, and I was going to I was going to prison, went to preliminary trial, and didn't do anything. And you know, and I'm an ex-cop. It really stings then, you know. But I saw the corruption and. Greg knows about that, and then he's somebody case later, and how the FBI followed me and such. Um, it, it happens all the time. They, you know, look at Waco and Ruby Ridge, the, um, Oklahoma City. You know, mm -hmm. those are whole, those are those are still cases that are, you know, that a lot of corruption was behind it. So it happens all the time, and usually the bigger the case, the more there is. Well, it's sad to actually realize that it's more common than. We yeah. think it's kind of scary. It's, it's and is it like, true that it's supposed to go all the way up, like even senators and sir, congressmen oh, oh. are covering this? Especially when you see, you know, there was a there was a stat I gave Greg when before our last uh, show, and it was um, Calvert's County, and you know, there's a lot of connections with Freemasons and all that kind of stuff. We can get to later, but um, Whitehead was three times the average per capita suicide rate in California and the nation. Okay, why is this? And we started looking at, you know, now, you know, like with with um, uh, David's wife and daughter, there's two suicides, so that'd be a stat. And so, yeah, we're seeing if who's ever involved was Philip Marshall. That's two su suicides in a murder. And you know, Calvert's County, why is that the highest per capita in the nation? You know, and, and there's a lot of these suicides uh, that are, you know, deep state connected. And that seems, to, you know, and so why is there so many? Did you see? And there's a lot of gov government officials that retire up in the mother load, and they're, you know, and you know, Philip Marshall was with Barry Seal, and wrote books. So, um, that's the, that's why the, the, when I'm looking at Calvert's County and all the so-called murders and such um, that are called suicides. That's why the rate's so high. Yeah. You know, is it why? I'm not sure. You know. And why aren't the higher ups like the FBI and stuff like that? Why aren't these high suicide rates? Well, you know, these are murders, and they they, they they want they don't want to be murders because, you know, they 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 know who did it or who's involved in it, you know, um, and so they make them look like suicides and then vilify the father who ever pulled the trigger, and they go back and all he was on crazy bipolar drugs whatever and they do it all on that. The problem is is that people know these people and they're, how they are and everything else, and it, it goes against the grain of that he would take his family out himself. You know, and that's so all those. Everybody that, like we talk about Michael Hastings and Gary Webb and Phil Marsh and everything, these are all these are all suicides. You know, and like, really? <laughs> you know, they 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 were whistleblowers, basically, in a good way. And they have, they, you know they have it's, information they have to take them out. Yes, yeah, it's me every time. Yeah, I'm going to commit suicide. I'm going to shoot myself two times in the back of the head. <laughs> yeah, that yeah that that. How do you do that? You know. Mm -hmm. It's magic. Yeah, that's why this one here, guys, it may not, it, it's, it, it could be an inside job and not a deep state thing in a, in a shadow ops of what we'd see normally, because it, it is awful sloppy and, you know, um, you, you know, or they hired, they hired hit guys that were made to, you know, to make it a mess, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, the more evidence there is, the, the better chance a lot of times of not solving the case. But pretty soon you got something that's, Questioning outside of circumstantial, and you know they know they get a defense attorney because of one bullet it blows the whole case. You know, they look at it that way. This this thing's just a little bit too messy for them. You know, so what's the motive? What it is? I, I think it could be the guys that weren't weren't going to be going to California. Who knows? You know, and, and it could you know could have, I mean it could have been you know the other thing is could have been directly you know the, those guys might have but might have sold out. When we might, the way they, some of these guys are, it wouldn't be tough to buy them, you know, some of the Saudis that came in or told them what to do or, 
you know, this, this is what you're going to do for X amount of money. There's definitely some money behind this. You know, there's too much work here for just to be somebody really pissed off. Mm-hmm. So there's 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 a, there's an agenda somewhere behind this. You know. One of the things that really stuck out to me was that the staging of the crime scene. It mm-hmm. seemed like it had been done in layers. Is that the right term? Sure. Almost like they I kept thought, coming yeah. back and and doing a little bit more like overstaging and I just somebody had to be very familiar with that house to be in mm-hmm. and know how to get in and out to be able to do that well and another yeah. thing I, um, I want um, that I find interesting and in, in how I think it goes up just a little bit higher and I agree with you this is so sloppy it, it doesn't reek of, of a professional but um, yet, um, the metadata on the photos from BCA um, has been altered by the BCA, and um, and I'm talking altered. altered time. Yes, time stamps, date, uh, not the date, but the time. Um, it, times are wrong. And you can tell where it has been altered. Again, you wouldn't know if you weren't if you didn't have the right um, uh, it, uh, programs. I'm sorry, it's late here, and I'm really tired, so my brain is kind of starting to shut down. Um, uh, with with the proper, I, I use Lightroom and Corel Paint Shop Pro to edit my photos, and by putting them in Lightroom, um, I believe it was Lightroom. I could see metadata and that's when it struck me and I talked to Dan and I said hey 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 these photos have been altered the timestamps this metadata has been changed this yeah, you, I know you see that yeah absolutely wow. and it's it scared me honestly it, it did I don't normally get scared but I'm like oh holy potato cakes that's not what I said <laughs> um, I'm like uh, this was changed at a higher level, so why would, I'm thinking to myself, why would that occur? Um, so, so, people, so let's, say some, let's say somebody IDs the brother with the presence, they can, they can work around that by fixing the time stamps or whatever to say, oh, he was there, so he couldn't have done it or what have you. Um, you know, they're going to try to work the time on, on those, because the, the, the time of death, or longevity, longevity of death, you know that that can, that's varying from you know the postmortem lividity to de- decom. <laughs> Say it again. Decomposition or decomposing. Decomposition. God, why is that a word? I must I must have. A, it's late. Anyway, We're all tired. I know. No, that's okay. Decomposition. Um, that um, uh, just to get a tight, tighter timeline, you know, to cover to cover anybody's. Oh, we saw this guy at that time. Why do you think the guy says, oh, he saw it on the 10th? Well, really? So the package is out there. Well, maybe they weren't there or they were there. You know, there's something with the package, like Greg said. That it throws something in there where you're going to get somebody that's going to hang outside and be noticeable because, um, sh- you know, they show up. It, it says, oh, we saw those packages there. They can work around that maybe in the story. And people say, I saw them there. No, I saw them there. Not everybody's going to notice them the same day they're put there. So maybe that, you know, it definitely could be um, – you know, a worm out there kind of wiggling around saying, oh, these packages were here this time, not that time. And if somebody comes in and questions the case, then it changes the time stamps on it. But you can still go back to the original forensics and, and know what that time of that photograph is, right? Correct. Well, if you have the right programs, you can. If you don't, it shows as just the time stamp that was altered. And that is how I was able to catch it. Um, I was getting ready, and it was just a fluke. I was getting ready to do um, again, just some processing and, and bring, you know, do some edits on a photo to see if I could get some detail out. And I just happened to glance, and I noticed two different dates, two different times for the same event on the same day. And I'm like, hey, wait, wait a second, that shouldn't be. And so I started, and it wasn't on all of the photos, like you said, but the way you're explaining it, now that makes sense. And um, and I'm like going, oh, okay, so I contacted Dan right away, and I'm like, Dan, Dan, <laughs> you got to help me here because I'm about ready to, to, you know, blow my top because it was just so 
freaky to see that that type of manipulation and to be done at that level and you can even see the names well the names that are given now whether or not it was the person who did it or not is a whole different ball game because if what you're saying is true they could easily alter the name of the person who supposedly changed this timestamp as well well it's like it's like you get a photograph you go into properties and you, and you can change some stuff in there you know you can change the author of that photograph or whoever it is you know and you can do that it's just if you get the original or get the original files i'm sure you can go back or even if you got the equipment like you said or they get the software to go back before that but I, you know i take photographs off of uh, wiki commons and i've gone in there and i can i can i can go in the properties and change the name the name owner of it you know and that's pretty easy to do um my question is is that were the photographs in the properties and the metadata were they all numbered and um and id uh re renamed or what have you they're, they're all they're all marked with something besides a jpeg number or, or whatever Correct. They're all they all given. Uh, there is different information, um, but not all of them. No, were altered. No, um, not at all. It. But you can tell that the ones that were altered because they fall differently within the the um, the numbering system. Oh, I don't know how to explain it again. I'm really tired. No, I, I, I'm, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting you on that. Sure. Yeah. I'm not an expert like you, but yeah, I understand it absolutely. Yep, and and that again, that was the thing that kind of caught my eye because when they're photographing, and as you, um, they they work from a bigger circle into a tighter circle, and and when they're halfway through, say they're kind of in the middle circle, and you have all these photographs of the middle of the scene, and then the next set of photographs are from out far again, right. That kind of, again, these are the things that caught my eye, and I'm like, wait a second, this photograph is out of sequence, why? And then when I take a look to the right, and I start to see the timestamps, then I start digging deeper, and I'm like, uh-oh, this is not good. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a chronology by, you know, you can look at, this was taken at this time, or it's the same shot, but, you know, maybe the guy took two steps over. So the, chrono the chronology was off, and you caught that. Correct. It's like say they're to the point to where they're they're photographing, let's say the bodies, and and just as an example, they're now in this tight circle, and now they're getting here, and they're all the photographs should now be in uh, taken in in the chron chronological order, like you stated, should be all in that area, but say you have a picture of the rug, the body, the rug, the body, the outside door. Sure. This is sure. this is where it's like going. Oh, okay, that is some. These are the things that caught my attention, and it's like that's what led me to to look a little bit deeper. And that's when I found, um, again, by looking at this photo, getting ready to do, some, you know, an edit to it, and then noticing that the metadata was altered, and I'm like, okay, not not a good not a good sign. It didn't leave me with warm no. fuzzies. No, no, absolutely not. photo of the body bags is that the one that really uh, I'm trying to remember it's been, what? on that one it was the time the time stamp yeah, on the body time. bags was um, on on the the changed metadata was 10 or 1045 at night and we know for a fact that they were not photographed and not even there because they weren't even put into bags until what what did you find out um, 1230 one o'clock in the morning uh, between yes between 1230 and one o'clock in the morning yeah so that's a big time difference oh absolutely and that was the big thing that really caught our attention because we were like, okay, well, then the, they really are changing the time because we have the proof that they were there at a certain time bagging these bodies because of the autopsy reports. Yeah, that's what led me down the rabbit hole. Thank you. I'd forgotten which photo I was working on, but you were correct, Sophia. That was the one. Gosh, this case is a huge rabbit hole. <laughs> Yeah. Going down the rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> it's all <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Got the red pill and the blue pill. Which one? Right. Grab wow. them both. <laughs> Take them. <laughs> God, I know. This, 
<laughs> yeah, this like I said before we get off. The biggest thing to me, I'm looking at a motive. You know, how how far did deep state did it go? Mm -hmm. Why they hire hacks? Maybe there's a reason they hired hacks. You know, um, pro pros just aren't going to get that dirty. You know, and you know, they used to they used to shoot people for five hundred dollar Michael Jordan Air Jordan shoes. I mean, so it doesn't take a lot of money. No. Right. Did you want to uh, continue off air? Or did yeah, you want yeah, to? Yeah, I, I, yeah we, we can. Sure. I just need about okay. a two minute break. About a minute break. Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll, leave my phone, I'll leave my phone on. Yeah. Is there anything else, Greg? Um, I think. I think that's all I have for now. Um, oh, one last that's thing. One last great thing. Great discussion. Yeah, one last thing. Um, did we did we talk about that uh, David's mom died a couple months after this happened? Did I tell yeah. you that or no? Got that. No, we, we talked about the... the we have so much to go okay. over. There's yeah. so much more. We, I, I hope we can get you to come back like a lot because <laughs> everybody's really enjoying you being here. Yeah. And we have more oh, questions. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, you guys, you guys gave me a lot of really important information also. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna save the rest that I have here then, um, and we'll, we'll we'll get back to all of that um, on our on our next show. And yeah, I look forward to that. Sure. So, um, if anyone has any final words here, uh, Derek's asking when the next one will be. Hopefully, within a, within maybe a week or maybe maybe two. Maybe we can get everybody on. Uh, maybe at a, a at an earlier day at an earlier time, <laughs> but we can work all of sure. all of that out here. Is everybody, where's everybody, everybody in, where you and I are in California, but they're out of state, huh? Yeah, they're out of state. Kathleen and Sophie are out of state. Yes, yes, we're out of state. Good, good. And oh, safe. at least we separate a little bit, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> we cover all four corners of the world. No, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to be, huh? Yeah, right. Because we have yeah. more work ahead of us. Yeah. <laughs> Just getting started, but glad to have you looking in, into this case, and uh, I think, um, you know, this is this has been been great. So unless anybody has any uh, final words, I'm gonna go ahead and shut this public conversation down. I just want to say thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Oh, well, I appreciate it. And uh, my you know my book Ultimate Prey it's on on Amazon. But uh, if you want to, I'll send you guys a um, I'll get the emails from Greg. Send you guys a PDF copy. So you know it's 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 basically the first proof and it's all PDF and such. But it's what's in the book now after 12 years. So. Um, I'll send you a copy of that. Won't cost you anything. I'll send it to you. You know, um, uh, email. Be great. Yeah, yeah that, take a look at it. Yeah. That needs. Yes, I, yeah, I would love to. In fact, I will actually. I'm going to buy the book. I I'm one of, I'm old fashioned. I love you to hold to a hard copy in yeah, my hand. Oh, I know. Oh, <laughs> I know. That that's that's the only way to go. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I will be I buying actually it. Actually, just bought the book that you had mentioned for the Philip Marshall case. Uh, Last circle. Is that, that oh, the last, oh, the last circle with Sherry Seymour, yes. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. went and bought that book. Nice. That book, it gets into the pose and a lot, lot of that, yeah. And, and um, it's what basically comes around to my story in my book. It's, it follows right in the same routine. And, you'll, yeah, last circle, it's, it's heavy. It goes into uh, Inns Law and Ro Rose Law Group with Hillary Clinton and everything. Yeah, it's deep. Wow, I am so yeah. excited to dig into that one. Yeah, I've been trying to get a hold of Sherry. I've never met her, spoke with her. She's kind of still hiding out. Um, she's down south. Somewhere, but we, we, we're on emails together, but I still want to get a cup of coffee with her uh, because she was the first one to break a lot of that. Just right around the same time as the Iron and Contra stuff. And, uh, so she was right, right, right on that side of it. Mariposa, small county, it, it leads right to the, uh, you know, the front front door of uh, the Clintons. You know, and that's like whoa. So mm. she covers a lot of that in there. The other book to look for. Is the Last Mogul by um, Dennis McDougal? The Last Mogul about Lou Wasserman and how MC Entertainment was um, running a lot of the drugs through Yosemite, and that's where Mariposa is at. So that's an interesting read too. Wow! Yeah. Yeah, and that ties into your uh, Freeway Ricky Ross, Greg, and everything. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's part. Of, it's part. A lot of it's part of that. Sure. Yeah, I'm just pulling that up here now. Awesome. I'll add it to yeah, the Last list. Mogul. Very good book. Really enjoyed it. Tells you about how Hollywood started and how the drugs went through there, and they did go through. You know that's why Mariposa was corrupt, and because the drugs went through Mariposa to get to Yosemite Park, and it's right in the book. Wow. Yeah. Dennis McDougall. 
a really good. He wrote the first Yosemite murder book. I wrote the second. He wrote the first one. Nice. Well, I, I still think your yes. your book needs to be made into a a feature a feature film some someday. I just I'm just really fascinated by it. It's a great book. Yeah. No. Thank you. It's still a goal. it's still a goal. You know, we keep my real job of working on that on the side. Definitely. I just want to write more books like you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta catch like up now. I got, I got I got I got one. <laughs> I, got, I got 224 pages. You got a thousand pages. <laughs> It's all good, my friend. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm going to go ahead and thank thank you to everybody in our chat room. And, yes, we'll make sure that everybody knows when our next show is happening. Uh, this is the, the David Crowley Questions conference call, gray stage number 198. And I will end this live stream right now. God bless you all.